special town council board of education joint meeting on November 29, 2020. Uh, before we begin, I just want to do a round table of everyone as most people are online. So Steve Jones, town council chair, and I'll start from left to right with Jacob Mari. If you want to say your name and the board that you represent. Yep. Jacob Mari, board of education. Christine Griffin, board of education. Christina Fuller, board of education. Ashley Longbread, uh, Board of Education. Sophia Shade, Board of Education. Jada Feldman, Board of Education. Tony Holt, Board of Education. Hello, uh, Town Council. Hello, I'm Jen Gallagher, Board of Education. Jane Register, Board of Education. Well, let's simply challenge. Lisa Gancock, Temporary Town Manager for Town. And I do recognize we have a couple of officials online, so if you want to raise your hands and unmute yourselves, introduce yourselves. A uh, point of privilege, Mr. Jones, we can barely hear you. There's a lot of noise in the background, and I couldn't hear the introduction for about half the people. I don't know if you want to get the vice in yet. I'm making some of the noise, but otherwise I'll encourage everyone to speak loudly. It, your microphone is also cutting out. How much is it cutting out? <sighs> I... It's going to be very difficult to be able to participate in this meeting um, with the way it's set up right now. It's very difficult to hear about two thirds of the people who are sitting there and it cuts out in the middle of, a, of your sentences. I, maybe Mr. Luba can speak to that. Uh, yeah, Mr. Chair, if you could just, uh, just say something again and I, cause I mean, I was hearing it fine. Uh, there, there was a little, issue, uh, but whatever you uh, did to, to uh, correct it, it seemed to correct itself. Okay, we'll do a quick test, see if this is, everyone can hear me clearly now? Yeah, uh, that's, I can hear you fine, thank you. Okay. For the record, Lou Luba, Town Council. Thank you, Councilor Luba. All right, so there's no other issues with the audio. It seems like we just turn off the noise, and it seems like just want to remind everyone to speak very clearly and loudly as much as possible when you're speaking, as well as identifying yourself. So you'll move into the joint discussion with the town council. Oh, sorry about that. One point. Uh, with Sandy Khan, if you want to introduce yourself for the record, and to speak loudly and clearly when you're all settled in. Uh, you find time, time, time. All right, thank you, Sammy. All right, so item number two, joint discussion with the Town Council and Board of Education regarding the artificial turf replacement capital project. Uh, if Lisa or Dr. Willett would like to start off with a brief summary of the item. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. I'm Lisa Hanson. For those of you who do not know me, I'm the interim temporary town manager. And um, just a little, I, I included in your packet this evening some background regarding the artificial turf field. Online tonight, we also have Peter Sataba, who is in charge of facilities for the Board of Education. We also have Scott Lappin who is our public works director and Bruce Watt, who is our recreation director and all have certain background knowledge regarding the artificial turf field. The, um, a little bit of background, back in 2012-13, the artificial turf was installed at the high school. That particular project was a little over a million dollars and we funded it with state grant funding, um, donations and uh, some bond issuance that um, was supposed to be paid back through charges to the various recreational uh, athletic leagues in the town. And then there was a misunderstanding as where the balance was supposed to come from to reimburse the debt, which was supposed to be from the, um, uh, the town recreation, I'm not sure of the exact athletic organization. So there was a misunderstanding there, what they were supposed to try to do. Um, 
different fundraising events to make up the difference. And that happened, some of it didn't. So it, in the meantime, um, the sports leagues, the sports organizations have been paying their share each and every year. There was a, a, a little bit of an allowance last year because of the COVID constraints and they couldn't use it. And um, the, I'm not going to get into all the details, but that funding information of what we've received so far is in the report that I shared with you. So now we're looking at the point where we need to replace the field in a couple of years. And there really hasn't been any funding put aside because the field did not generate sufficient revenue to set reserves in place to replace that field. So the only alternative is to issue some sort of debt, whether it's a lease financing or, um, or bond issue or some other alternative that may have to be considered. We're being told right now that the cost to replace that field is about 850,000. I know this report says 825, but <coughs> we've received some other information since this was put together. Um, there, there's other information in here regarding um, different questions that have been asked over the last few months. So I tried to put it in. There was a, a warranty. There's a maintenance agreement between the board and the town. And part of what I think we'll be discussing this evening as well is that um, overall um, shared service maintenance agreement as well as the artificial turf. The current condition of the field, uh, it, it's starting to wear. They say we may have at least another year or two before it has to be replaced. So we, we um, worked with a, uh, the town engineer to try to get some ideas of what would be the most beneficial thing to do. And it certainly is discussed among everyone involved as to how to proceed. So we looked at what the cost would be to eliminate the artificial turf and just replace it with sod. And then we also looked at replacing the artificial turf. My summary shows that the artificial turf is more desirable than real grass in the effects that it, you know, because there's many, of is many issues with the grass field, although, the downside of that is that it's going to be costly and it will have to be replaced every 10 years or so, 10 to 12 years. Um, so these are the things you have to um, balance when trying to make a decision. But the, uh, the grass field will require free draining base underneath the loam, uh, so it'll dry quickly. If it doesn't dry quickly, you're gonna lose playing time on the field. Um, the field will have to be irrigated if you have grass in order to um, not develop weeds and, and not to burn out. The grass would have to be mowed and repainted weekly, which will require more um, staff time to do that. The artificial turf does not require that because the lines are basically sewn right into the turf itself. The high school uses for the the high school uses the football field, the soccer, the lacrosse, uh, both men's and women. Um, with all this playtime, the grass will wear out very quickly. And in areas such as the goal mouth, the penalty kick area, the face mask, the face <laughs> face off soccer, uh, soccer and lacrosse, all these issues can only be addressed with no playing on the field for a period of six weeks with new sod being put down every few months or grass to germinate. So it takes away some of the playing time that you have to find alternate spots while that is being rejuvenated. The cost to replace the sod would add to the annual cost um, and we don't have that estimated cost at this time. Line painting can be a challenge. For instance, soccer, soccer uses white lines, lacrosse and football use different colors. Different paints would need to be purchased and, and it would have to be done frequently. The artificial turf has all the colors already built into it and you don't have to keep changing. The artificial turf would not require fertilization or other similar maintenance. The artificial turf would allow for more playing time and less relocation costs. 
Um, there's certainly, you know, a lot of cost benefits that, you know, you need to consider. Um, it, you know, it could be a community concern. Community may be used to that field and not want to change. I have no idea what, what the um, community's thoughts are on that at this time. But certainly it's up to the town council and the, and the group to decide what way you would want to proceed with this. Um, in any event, if, if you do go with the artificial turf, having it put in again, um, I would recommend that we start building a way to replace it in 10 years so we're not trying to hit it, get hit up all at once for $852 million, $850,000 million. Um, currently, I've included it in next year's, the year after next capital uh, improvement plan. I'm working with our financial advisor to have it built in as a 10-year amortization schedule, which means that you pay it off over 10 years rather than 20 because you want it to be for the life of the asset. So that's certainly going to impact our debt somewhat um, if, if we were to proceed that way. That's one scenario I'm looking at. Um, doing different things, we're trying to play around with those numbers. So that was a brief, <laughs> not brief, uh, just an overview. And certainly there's more information in the document, the cost, uh, cost of analysis and all that. Thank you, Lisa. Dr. Will, do you have any additional commentary you'd like to provide? I know that uh, Lisa sent me an email that uh, Peter is limited in his time. So if they have any additional commentary, I would offer them a chance to speak as well. Yeah, I I uh, I think Lisa's done a great job. I think the documents and materials have been out for some time, so I would defer to Peter. Peter's been gracious enough to be here for a little while, so I would say if people could, you know, if they wanted to ask any questions, that might be might be a good time to do so. Okay, thank you, Doctor Will. So I guess at that point, I will open the floor to questions. But I encourage if any counselors or board members have questions for Pete Salva, please direct those uh, first. To them so that uh, they can all be answered at the meeting. If there's anyone that would like to ask a question, you can signify if you're on Zoom with the raise hand button for Counselor from Lucy and Counselor Lupa. Otherwise, if everyone just raises their hand in the library program room, I'll just identify you by using your hand. Uh Mr. Jones, uh, I'm sorry, it's uh, Lulu, but if, if we can, just to make it a little bit easier for everybody to see what's going on and to see uh, see the room, uh, since I, I think that all of us have the agenda, um, uh, and that if we could just reduce that, that way I think that uh, at least on the screen side here, that we'll be able to see everybody on the Zoom um, rather than just having just the, uh, the small amount that we can see, uh, just a personal request. Hey, at least I don't know if there's any way if you can adjust that a little bit. I think that we could probably just close it out uh, unless there's unless there's a true need to keep the agenda up there. Share it out if you'd like. Yeah, just close the screen share. I think we'll for a little bit, but in case there's anyone in the public that wants to see the the packet, if there's any references that are made, want to reshare that screen for them. Okay. But otherwise, for the time being, we can stop the screen share for a moment. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, that's all I have at this point for right now. And then I believe, Colleen, did you have a nice idea raise your hand? Yeah, I have two quick questions for Ms. Zaha. Um, I know Ms. Hancock just said that the artificial turf is now $850,000. Did the, also the grass field go up as well? Or Dr. Willett, do you know that answer? That the grass field increased as well, because Lisa just said it went up $850,000 for the turf field. Yeah, I would I would just be making an assumption that everything is going on. But. And then I think Ms. Hancock, you said that artificial turf is good for 10 years. I was under the assumption it's good for at least 15 years. 10, 10 to 12 years. Um, you know, 12 years is kind of pushing the end of the field. And um, but that's usually the life. Yeah, I know Scott Lapp and also they do they've done in the field in the seating, he'd probably be a good person to ask with respect to increased costs for that process. And he's here as well, if you'd like to know. 
Hey uh, guys, this is Pete. Um, I just kind of want, wanted to speak to lifespan of the turf uh, field. Um, ba based upon the fact that we have multiple different sports using different sections of the turf field um, at different times of the year, spring, fall, winter, and so on, summer, um, that will shorten the lifespan of that field a bit because you have just different types of wear. You have different types of gear with football versus soccer. You have um, lacrosse sticks hitting the, the uh, field. You've got the wear points from the penalty, uh, the penalty kick area in soccer, the corner kick areas, the uh, uh, face-off areas, and so on. So uh, with that in mind, if this was a single sport field like, you know, soccer and CFC or something like that, uh, you could kind of focus on fixing some of the wear areas of that specific field and extend the lifespan longer. But we actually have uh, some pretty consistent wear throughout our field based on the fact that we do have multiple different types of uh, sports. So that will shorten a lifespan. Um, and you're probably in the 10 to 14 years, probably would be the very most based upon the fact that we have such a vast, vast amount of different programs and sports that do use that field. I think that's all I have for now. Thank you, Colleen. Oh, Councilor Shabia, followed by Councilor Mitchell. Perfect. Uh, Mr. Stava, could you let us know approximately how many hours weekly it would be to maintain a sod field? Ms. Hancock mentioned um, the mowing the lawn, mowing the grass, painting the lines. Well, how how much time would that take weekly um, to to maintain that? Um, I. I cur currently do not oversee the actual mowing of the grass fields, but if if you look at actually what is needed as far as weed trimming, mowing of the field, fertilizing that, that field, watering it, lining it on a weekly basis, uh, you could be in upwards of one guy just a sign there for eight hours a week, um, every single week, uh, to actually do all that, uh, that the work. So, uh, that does add up a lot over time. Uh, Scott might be able to speak a little bit more in regards to the actual manpower that he has within his own crew. Um, but you know, I've got to look on my side too. I'm going to deal more with, uh, more broken sprinkler heads because uh, that does actually happen. Uh, I get them on the other fields and baseball, softball, and so on. So there is additional maintenance cost with that. Uh, we have to look at the size of the irrigation pumps as well as the storage tanks to see if that will basically work well for us. Um, I think it will, but we're going to have to rotate watering schedules if if uh, that is the case. Uh, and then it just comes down to, to, to field use time. You're going to have to rotate different sports on there. Um, you're going to use the practice fields more often, uh, which will create more wear on those fields also. Um, so if you go grass field there, you got to look at your other grass fields because they're going to see a lot more wear too because now we have to rotate everybody around. Um, and then scheduling will make it difficult also as well because of that uh, rotation of fields. Thank you, uh, Lisa, did you want to have yeah, Scott I, over? Yeah, I'd like to add? also have Scott provide input if that would be okay. Yes, that's fine. Scott Lappin, would you please sign on? Thank you. Sure, good evening. Um, when we looked at uh, what we figured was going to go into this for maintenance, it's uh, it's probably more than eight hours a week. It's probably closer to two full days. Um, we have to mow the field every week to keep the grass short enough for when they're uh, playing soccer and lacrosse, especially. 
again, two different colors of paint. Um, the, the maintenance that goes into that, it, it's not like we can, uh, we have one line painter, so we can go out and paint the white lines. Then we have to go back and flush the whole system out, come back and paint whatever color, whether it's blue or red for the uh, um, other sport that's playing. One of the other things that uh, has to be kept in mind, which is, um, it's been touched on a little bit is when it comes time for us to do repairs in front of the goal mouths, the penalty kick area, the face off areas. If we put sod down sod, probably it takes about six weeks for it to reroute. If we don't go with sod and we go with grass, it's going to take much longer. You're going to lose a full season on that field. Um, and then this means relocating all those different sports to practice fields and what have you. You're not going to get the same <clears throat> quality of play out of it. The other thing that um, I'm sure nobody has lost sight of at this point was how wet of a summer we had. July and August, we had, I, I forget what the exact number was, how many inches of rain. But if you walked out on that, um, synthetic turf field the day after it rained, you could walk out there as long as we had, it hadn't rained in uh, probably eight or 10 hours, you could go out there and you could play on that surface because of the free draining base below it, the drainage system that's out there. If we had had a natural grass field out there, it wouldn't matter how, how good of a base you put underneath it. You put a nice sandy gravel underneath it. The loam is still going to hold the water. If you try to go out there and plan that, you are going to destroy the field and then we're going to be out of luck for at least a year. Um, I know that the, the rain's been gone for a while, but it's, it's, you know, it still sits there uh, pretty fresh in my mind and all the guys in the uh, DPW. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, as far as the, the maintenance goes, I, I really think that we would have to allocate at least two full days that's providing we don't get the aforementioned rain. If we get two days of rain, we can't go out on that field and start mowing. We're just going to have clumps. We can't paint. We can't do anything. And then it just snowballs into the next week. Whereas with the artificial turf, as Lisa said, the lines are sewn right into the turf. Um, it's a, uh, uh, I know it's, uh, a uh, costly endeavor, but when you look at what it would cost you to take that field out, put in loam, and make sure that that field is kept up to uh, the standards that you would expect to see at a high school, um, there's there's a lot of a lot of work, a lot of money and effort that go into that. Um, any any real technical questions? We have. Uh, uh, Jonathan Hickok with uh, CHA, he's on as well. He works with uh, our town engineer. Um, he had a lot of um, input on this whole project. So if you'd like to direct any of your questions towards him, I'm sure he's here to answer those. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Scott. Uh, so if you have any other questions before I go to Council Leader Champ? No, I'm all set. Thank you. Right. Thank you. We'll move the House to members. Okay, so yeah, Councilor Ejo, then followed by Councilor Luba. Take Luba, I have questions. Councilor Luba, you can go first, followed by Councilor Ejo. Oh, I was just going to submit the floor to her, but that's a that's all right. <laughs> you know better. <laughs> all right. Um, well, just uh, just a few questions that I had um, regarding the lifespan of the uh, uh, of the turf where uh, I know that Peter just mentioned uh, that we were looking at a possibility of a 10 to 14 years uh, on it. I think that that's what we were looking at for uh, for this current turf or even longer for this current turf, but we are now, we started talking about replacing it when, uh, when I first came on two years ago. So you're talking, that was really a seven year out of 10, uh, out of 10 to 14 before we actually had to start looking at replacing it. And, and I'm just concerned about, the wear and tear where you're talking uh, that Peter was talking about it, where you're going to have more wear in certain areas. And unlike uh, the, the grass where you could, or the sod where you could replace it. If there's wear, if there's wear in those areas, how do we repair something like that? I mean, that's, that's my first question is if there's an issue regarding the wear in certain areas, which just would 
I think would not fall under warranty because it's normal wear and tear. What's the, you know, what would, how do we do that? And what would, what would the cost be on that? That's my first question for whomever can answer it. This is John Hickok from CHA. Um, I, in your current field, I'm, I'm assuming that those areas are all the, the goal areas, your face off areas uh, are, are all one piece of turf. Uh, in a replacement, if you're finding that those areas are, um, are wearing excessively quick and want to maintain that, that area specifically, there are options that can be put into the design that will allow those areas to be replaced separately, um, uh, almost utilizing like Velcro on th those pieces of turf so that you can replace those areas uh, rather than replacing the entire field. Uh, on an existing field, those areas can be cut out and replaced with a, with a piece of turf. Uh, it's just like your carpet in your house, um, for, for, for lack of a better term, that it can be cut out and sewn back in uh, in the short term if those are excessively worn um, to, so that uh, you know, any, any safety requirements uh, are maintained within, within the goal areas or those high, high traffic areas uh, that, that the turf wears uh, uh, quicker than that, you know, that, that 10 to 14 years. Uh, might be something that you, you know, in goal areas, especially with cross and cleats and things of that nature. Uh, sometimes we see those at, you know, five-year intervals get a replacement of the crease area. So that that 10-foot circle gets replaced um, and, I, I'm, you know, back to, a I'm, you know, a serviceable condition, if that answers your question, sir. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. It does. Uh, but then my follow-up question to that is, is something like that kind of covered under warranty? Or is that something that we would then have to bear the cost once again for replacing uh, a turf? Yeah. So, so your warranty is going to be eight, eight, eight years. Um, is basically any turf is, is typically going to be about an eight-year warranty. I think there are a couple out there that are claiming a ten, but uh, in general, it's an eight-year warranty um, on the turf. Um, excessive wear in a crease area is not necessarily going to be covered under your warranty. Um, if the seam were to tear or a, you know, a carpet pulled away from a nailer or something of that nature, that would be warranty type items. If you had a, you know, a, a breakdown of your fiber for some reason that, 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 uh, you know, was not anticipated, that would be covered under warranty, but where areas at a crease or a face off X is not going to be covered under warranty. Okay. So then basically we're looking at the same type of issue, just in a different scale for if we were going to have uh, like uh, sod or grass, we're still looking at the same type of uh, swear and tear. It's just one, we're replacing it with grass or sod and then having to wait for it. The other one is that we would be replacing a section of, uh, of AstroTurf or whatever turf that would be, that would be used to cover that. Is that correct? That's correct. It, it, you know, I, I, as you said, when you replace sod and as Scott indicated as well, you solder grass, you're going to have an excessive wait time where these repair areas could be, could be completed and back in service in, in a few days um, based on, based on the repair. Um, also in, in the, in the, um, you know, replacement of the turf, if you were to replace the turf, um, it could be worked into the specification that those high wear areas, uh, your face off X, your, um, your crease areas, your corner kick areas, that that those are worked in for two replacements um, during the the lifespan of the turf. Um, so that turf is bought at the time of the of the install, rather than buying it later and paying escalation and things of that nature on those. So those can be worked into that into that process as it, um, it as you go through that design. All right. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. And then uh, my next question will be directed to either uh, uh, to Scott or Peter. Uh, regarding the maintenance for the uh, uh, for the turf field, I mean, I know that uh, Scott, you were saying about how you would have to mow it and then uh, maintain it and all these other things. What kind of maintenance are you looking at? Because I know that at least for the fall uh, fall sports and things like that, you'd have to go on there and still have to maintain it to some degree regarding the leaf blowing, the clearing, that kind of stuff. Uh, regardless, um, about how long are you dealing with it uh, as far as maintaining the turf on a regular basis right now? Are uh, you talking about the synthetic turf? 
Little yes, sir. Yes, sir. I am. Thank you, Scott. Okay. What we do is um, we have a, a tractor that's stationed up at the high school. And what we do is we go over that turf typically once a month. And it's what it does is it rejuvenates the rubber pellets underneath to kind of bring them back to life as well it has, as it has a magnet on it. You know, um, not singling anybody out, but people who use barrettes or, or whatever, uh, we pick up an awful lot of that stuff that gets intertwined in the, uh, into the synthetic turf. That all gets caught into a tray. We clean it out. We go out and do that once a month. Other than that, uh, every springtime, we, there's a, uh, a firm that comes in and goes out and tests for density as well as um, they go over and they sanitize the field the first time. And then after that, it's pretty much ultraviolet rays. They keep it, uh, keep it clean because you have, you know, bloodborne pathogens, uh, whatever. Um, but as far as the uh, synthetic turf, the, the maintenance is... I don't want to say it's minimal, but it's a lot less than uh, regular grass. Okay. And then uh, also you brought up um, another great point regarding the type of turf where right now, uh, are we looking to have the same type of turf uh, replace what we have on there now? I guess that's my main question is what type of turf are we looking at? Because I've heard some issues regarding the, uh, the whole type of rubber pellet turf, the type, the type of turf that we're using now where it's prone to more uh, easily wear and tear. And uh, are there other types of turf that we're looking at, that, like the synthetic turf? Um, I don't know if anybody can answer that. Um, I, would, I would go out and say that, yes, you know, back when this field was initially installed, that was the industry standard, the small rubber pellets, but with all the con health concerns over those pellets and what have you, that, in my opinion, from what I understand and or understand with this proposal would be that the, the, uh, artificial turf, as well as all of those, um, pellets would be eliminated in a brand new base, uh, of state of the art base for today, um, would be installed and then the turf over that. But again, John can, uh, um, elaborate on that. Yeah, I, I, I'm not completely aware of what the replacement turf is for, for here, but there are a multitude of turf options that you can choose from and, uh, uh, and a multitude of options that you can choose from for your, for your infill, whether that be organic infills versus sand and rubber, um, you know, virgin rubber versus uh, 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 not virgin rubber. Uh, there, there, there's, uh, there's, 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 I, we have vials and vials and vials of all of the different infills that you can choose from. Um, they all have pros and cons, and that and I think that would be part of the part of the uh, design process is, is is identifying the pros and cons to those. Some have more maintenance than others, um, and some uh, have longevity longevity differences than others. Um, again, the turf fibers there's there's a multitude of fibers as well. If you're having a a fiber failure issue. Um, it, you know, there, there's a multitude of fibers that can be looked at. Some have long, long history of the workhorse tarp fiber, um, maybe not as, uh, you know, as, as, uh, visually appealing. Um, and then there's, there's fibers that are more visually appealing, but they're, they're, they may not be as, as, as a, uh, as, 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 as I would say a workhorse, uh, option where they may wear out uh, quicker. But again, almost every turf has an eight-year warranty. Um, and if you get excessive wear just from normal play and not, you know, the, the mashing of a goal area with the goalie's cleats and, and face-off X's and things of that nature, um, those, those would be covered under that warranty up to that eight years. Obviously, beyond the eight years, you know, that eight to 12, that four-year time frame, you're you are on your own from that perspective when it when it comes to the uh, any sort of failure that happens on the turf. Yeah. Uh, and not to I mean not to belabor the issue and not to uh, I know that there's other people waiting to talk. So I'll just my last question would be, you know, we've taught you and you've mentioned before, John, and thank you very much for providing all this information. It's very helpful. Um, is the for the replacement of the artificial turf, you know, and you said that you could build it in. How much is that though? I mean, if we're talking, say. A, for a lacrosse crease, 
that that's that's playing lacrosse. I know that's a pretty large circle. Mm -hmm. And if you have like the corner kick areas or other things like that, or even say football, you know, you're running down the middle. That's, you know, there, that's, that's a lot of areas that if we were going to have to replace that, how much you know, just going on a lacrosse crease, how much would that be just for that section alone? I, uh, I mean, there, I, mean, I would say that y'all you know, cross crease is going to be anywhere from 2,500 to 5,000 bucks uh, for material cost. Um, it is, it, but it, it's not typical that you're going to get a wear line from football on a synthetic turf within the, you know, within the warranty period and, or the lifespan of the turf. It, it may get mat, matted down a little bit, but with regular grooming, as Scott indicates, he does on a monthly basis, which is fantastic. I can't tell you how many schools I go to and mm -hmm. they do it once every six months, which, you know, has voided warranty issues and things of that nature. So keeping your, you know, making sure your G-Max is tested on a regular basis, making sure that uh, you're, you know, it sounds like you do a disinfection process. I mean, those are all great things to, to keep the life of the turf uh, going, but those high wear areas, they have a cost. And whether that's 2,500 bucks, 5,000 bucks, 8,000 bucks, it's, there is a cost associated with having those spare parts to make it, to, to make it uh, uh, viable. Um, but what we say kind of a, a lot of times, a synthetic turf field acts as five grass fields. So from a usage perspective. So if you, if you are, you know, if you're gonna, you know, use your synthetic field, but the way it sounds, you use your synthetic field, you know, you need five grass fields to be able to rotate people around to make sure your grass fields don't get destroyed. Um, so just, I, I just keep that in mind as well. Okay. All right. But just so, just, I mean, just so I understand. So then you're talking just for, for example, that crease, you're talking 2,500 to possibly 8,000, depending upon all the circumstances and everything else. And that's what's the that just, type. Yep. Yeah. Is that, now, is that including the labor for installation or is that on top of it? Or is that, you know, and I'm sorry, I'm being I'm being very granular, but I need this is granular. This we need to understand this. So sure, sure, and, and, and you know, be, the the, the twenty five hundred eight thousand is likely going to include that that labor. But again, lay, that's labor four years from now, labor eight years from now, labor ten years from now, twelve years from now. So you're it. It's hard to predict what labor is. I mean, we just went through COVID. We went through crazy inflation. You know, it, and we went through crazy price increases. So it's it's hard to predict what the labor is. We can somewhat predict the material and we can't really predict that well anymore, just based on what it is. But I know that if you're gonna buy the materials during the during the install, you know that you have the materials on site and you've paid a dollar for it. Now you have to, you know, you have to have enough money to have that installed. And it like I said, it is fairly easy if it's planned for in the design. Uh, you know, through it's it's like a a, a super duty Velcro system. They pull it out, put it in, redo the infill, and groom it back out in a day or so. You're done. So. Okay, Roger. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. That's all I have at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Luba. Councilor Nuccio, followed by Councilor Bluesy. Thank you. Um, I have a few questions, uh, Lisa. The original bond of the three hundred thousand dollars. Do you know how long we bonded that for? Uh, it was 10 years. It was funded for 10 years. Okay, so if we had received the payment that the town was promised to receive, with the 89000 coming from the sports teams, the 105 from town athletics, and then the 42000 from rentals, it would have only been a cost to the town of $64,000, right? But currently we only have $89,000 that we've received. Sorry. <laughs> I think it was around 89, but then we have re received, we will be receiving more this year as well. Well, I guess my, my point here is if we're looking at the next field being at $850,000, if we continue to get the money from the sports organizations, we're looking at a max of about $150,000 payment from them, which means a net $700,000 from the town to replace the field. And that doesn't cost, that's just the field and none of the other stuff. And that would be a 10 year bond also, correct? Right, and the, and the thing is, you know, once we get our grants person on board, um, let's hire somebody, the hope would be to see if there's any grants out there as well to help offset what the cost of debt would be. 
but currently we're just showing it as debt until we can find, see if there's anything out there. Last time we got a couple of different grants, but we don't know right now what's available out there. <coughs> okay. Um, and, and in regards to the, the field, I think Mr. Luba hit on one of the things that I was going to say. I've talked to a few coaches that have been down on the field and walked it and that, and I know the main areas of where are the lines. Um, so is there a repair option for us? Because right now, if that went in 2013, 14 years is 2027 for a replacement. 12 years gets us to 2025 for a replacement. So that still pushes us out. But if we were able to repair the lines, that would get us um, for the use of the field before we would have to start, before we would have to start paying to replace it. Well, I think I, I'd like to defer to Scott and possibly Bruce as well. If um, like I know there are some photos yeah. in your package on the line, but Scott, can you please address that? Yeah, we went um, back in uh, early spring, I believe it was, Bruce Watt and um, our former town manager, Mike Rosen, and I walked that, that field. There were some spots where I believe it was like a yellow colored striping was actually, it looked as though it was coming unsewn from the field. But there were, there were other areas that were off the beaten path, if you want to call it, that, that seemed as though they had uh, holes starting to wear on them. And I don't know whether that's from just the kids warming up in the same spot all the time, but it, it just seems strange that it was kind of off to the side of the, uh, the field of play. Um, I know Bruce is on Bruce. Do you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, I would, I would definitely have to agree with what you were saying. Um, you know, it just wasn't just some of the seams on those lines. There were some areas where it looked like there was uh, almost like an impression, like Scott was saying, of um, and areas where it, it, I, where I've seen uh, warm ups going on there. So it, it very well could have been what Scott was saying. Well, I guess same question though: Is there a repair option that would get us through the fourteen years rather than looking at replacing a million dollar field in two years? I would, I would say the repair option, Tammy, is probably what John was talking about, having somebody come in, cut out the area, the affected area, put the, uh, the Velcro backing on, if you will, around the, the perimeter of the area, and then fit a piece in. Unfortunately, it's going to look like patchwork because it, it's not material that was um, purchased at the same time and hasn't been exposed to the same amount of sunlight and what have you. And depending on, you know, I know we don't want it to look like we're, you know, a, uh, um, a backwoods, um, town, if you will, but that's, that's the, uh, that's basically what it's going to come out as, because again, it's going to be a completely different color green, uh, for the field. Um, but it, it can be, it's, there were some areas that were safety concerns that should be addressed. And, you know, they weren't that big of an area. I mean, some of the ones I saw were probably two by two or three by three, which um, I don't think would, would carry a, a huge price tag to them, but it's uh, um, going forward. If this synthetic field uh, does come to fruition, then I would think the, uh, the best option would be as uh, John had recommended and, and have, you know, spare, um, sections already already figured right into the uh, uh, the whole equation. I'm not too concerned with looking, uh, keeping up with the Joneses. The Joneses on the look. If we can add a few thousand dollars and do some repairs, a little discolored green when you're running on it, doesn't seem like a, a bad a bad hit. Um, no, no, I agree. Tammy, so, this is Pete. Uh, I just want to put piggyback on uh, what uh, what uh, Scott said I I was present for that uh, walk as well and uh, we have fixed a couple areas uh, by sewing in some some of the lines that have uh, pulled up especially the uh, red line and yellow line line uh, line sections uh, that's that's been done a couple times in my six, my six years here um, but the, the other thing that we were concerned about 
was the old overall fiber height. And that fiber height is really what holds your process underneath the rubber pellets uh, from basically, um, uh, you know, spreading around in, in a fashion that's going to create these dead spots, which affects your GMAX in various areas. So we are concerned about overall fiber thickness that's on that field now. Uh, which I think is is a bigger concern than fixing a few sections because we can only groom that field so much and spread the rubber around, and it's only going to be held in place by the depth of our fiber. Okay, so um, and it's not that the fact the fiber is compressed, and I've seen plenty of fields where the fiber is literally flattened so that uh, it, it almost looks like like a wet dog or something like that where, where that fiber is laying flat. Um, we don't have that issue on this type of field, but that fiber thickness is thinning. So there's not a lot we could do about that when it becomes uh, a significant percentage of the square footage of that field which we looked at a lot of different areas. And yeah, the fiber did vary a little bit, but it was never long in any of the areas at all. So we are kind of seeing some even wear. And some of the things that Bruce Watt mentioned could be related to, you know, various pieces of uh, equipment being put on the field. Um, a tackling dummy that's always put in the same location for football, you know, weeks on end, okay? Or uh, soccer bringing the goals to the middle of the field. Um, or, you know, the water cooler being put in the same place every single time, okay? Um, turf, fields are, uh, turf fields are intended, like any field, to have spread, you know, not have pieces of equipment just dumped in the same spot every time. So um, I, I think that's the, the biggest concern is, is, is that fiber height. Uh, so a repair option might buy us a little time, but you're, you're not going to pick up more than a couple years at the most um, because that fiber height is, is thinning. And that will affect the uh, GMAX, which is the biggest concern because then we're going to get more and more kids getting in, injured out there for things that could that could be avoided. Thank you. Um, I would think a, a couple of years could give us some more time to kind of come up with a payment model on this. There were a couple other things that you had mentioned um, in, when you were talking that I just wanted to go over. So I don't know any other high schools that have a, um, just a dedicated like one field. Like their turf fields are all multi-use. I, you know, typically turf fields are multi-use. They're definitely preferential from a playing perspective because they can be, <laughs> you don't have to worry about the wear and tear of football running up and down the yellow line, which is on side the white line for soccer and everything else. But I wouldn't think that it, it being multi-use is causing it to wear it anymore because I think that's how they're, they're set up to be. And in regards to the water, if we went back to a, a sod field or a uh, grass field, there was a grass field there prior to the turf field. So I would assume the infrastructure would be there to support water if um, if we had a grass field there prior to 2013, uh, the first, I think, what, four or five years that the high school was open, it was grass. So I would assume the infrastructure would be there. Would that be accurate? Okay. Um, from my understanding, they they had to rip all of that infrastructure that was there before up to put in the new turf field. But Scott, do you have the background? Oh, of the I don't mean like the field. I mean the water pipes. You That's mentioned the I water have. pipes and that, so the water pipes are coming. I that they have to install. Um, Here, Scott, do you have the background on what we have to install? Uh, the only thing I can offer is I know that the, the drainage is there. I'm not sure what is there as far as infrastructure goes for uh, irrigation, because uh, obviously with a, a synthetic turf field, you don't need any irrigation. Um, 
I know when, uh, when my son played there, he played on grass field to start with. And I remember the condition of that field. There were a lot of wear spots. It, it, it was, again, there was no alternative field to play on it. The, uh, you know, the town did the best they could keeping up with it. But when, you know, anybody who's watched a lacrosse or a soccer or football game know that the, uh, the grass surface takes a fair amount of abuse. Um, I, I really, that was, you know, quite a few years ago, he was in, uh, he was in high school. I think the first year that it actually opened. So it was quite a few years ago, but I do remember seeing a lot of uh, bare spots out in the field. Um, then Scott, my next question is for you. When you gave the estimates of two people full time, can you tell me which field you were comparing that to up with those estimates? That's based on um, us going out there, mowing that at least once a week to keep the grass at the right height uh, um, so that, you know, believe it or not, we have, uh, we have people in town, you know, a lot of coaches in town who say they really like to see the ball fields at an inch and a half high. So when the kids hit a ball, it doesn't, doesn't drag in the grass. And um, so we would probably have to keep that between an inch and three quarters to two inches. Um, that's mowing it once a week. Then if the grass gets away from us, we have to go out there and blow the grass off so that we don't have any clumps out there. Then it's laying out the field. If we, if we do it every week where we can still see the existing lines, it's much easier for us. If we have a, a period of rain, let's just say for uh, three or four days, and we go out and we mow it and we lose them, then we have to start pulling all new strings. That's two people out there um, relaying out the field, depending on what sport it is, and it could be two different sports. Uh, these are, these are estimates because we haven't, uh, we, it's been years. Nobody, uh, um, since I've been here, that field has been, uh, synthetic turf. Okay. Um, we're not doing that on any other current field right now to know exactly how long. Not, not to that extent. No, not for, uh, okay. And then, uh, Lisa, I guess my last question would be if, if this, if we're saying this is going to take two people a day up to $40,000, what's the cost of did we put this turf field in? Did we re did we reduce staff, or did we see a reduction in overtime, or anything like that, to show where we recaptured the savings? We um, back back then. I know we did reduce some staff in public works. And Scott, I don't know. You probably weren't here back then, but there have been some reductions in public works over the years. Um, I'm not sure if it was directly related to that because it was Steve was so involved in this. Steve previous town manager for Mike in, in uh, developing what he did with the whole turf. He, he made all the deals um, with it. So I couldn't tell you exactly how much was reduced, but I know we have lost staff in that area. Um, certainly there was overtime, a lot of overtime for a variety of things, which um, Scott has just kept that minimal over the years hasn't added much to it. Lisa, I also wanted to uh, point point out, uh, since Scott and I have both been in Tallinn and it's about the same time, we've both been here for six years now, um, you know, there, there have been losses on the public work side, but even to the tune, I think of maybe 10 to 14, 15 years ago, the Board of Ed used to have groundskeepers that were on their budget that were dedicated people that helped to maintain the board of that ground. Uh, we no longer have those, those uh, folks. Uh, they were moved over to the, either the public work side or just lost through uh, attrition over time. And, um, you know, as Scott would have to look at his staff and have dedi ded dedicated people to actually do this every single week. Um, and um, so when we look at the cost to transition from a synthetic surface to, to a natural surface, uh, those, those soft costs or those, uh, those you know, additional costs are gonna have to be looked at because uh, we don't have any dedicated folks on the board of ed side. 
Uh, we have a two person maintenance crew. Uh, you have custodians. Um, and we're not, uh, we don't have any of the uh, equipment to maintain that. So, uh, that's another thing that, uh, folks don't, uh, you know, may, may, may not have known is, is that, uh, is the loss of the groundskeepers on the uh, board of that side. Thank you, Peter. So my last concern on this is just, it's just the bonding. It's just the money of it. Um, you know, by the time we're done with this first 10 years and the, and the additional costs that we're saying, you're looking at cost of over $90,000 plus and that doesn't even include the interest, which you and I know that's what about 34% compounded over the 10 years, depending on how much we have to pay back. We're looking at, over 90 something thousand dollars a year um, that's going to hit the taxpayer for this. So um, I'm interested in any options that are on the board for savings that are out there, ERF money or end of the year savings or anything else to offset the cost of the field. Um, so we're not hitting the taxpayers for $100,000 a year in perpetuity because a 10 year bond, replace it again, a 10 year bond, replace it again. We're talking about $100,000 a year fit to the taxpayers for this. My frustration is I was here when all this went in. I voted on it when this came in. I was here. And this field was sold to the people of Tomlin as it wasn't going to cost the taxpayers money. It was going to be paid for by the athletic association, the funds, and this grand scheme of renting it out. And it was not going to be a cost to the taxpayers. Now here it is. We're not even at 10 years yet. And we're talking about replacing a million dollar field. So that's why I'm asking about repair options to at least get us to the 10, which is 10 to 15. And what can we do to reduce this, this hit to the taxpayers going forward? Because it's $100,000 a year. It's a lot of money. I, I agree with you. Um, as far as the hit, the only thing I could say is, you know, looking for grants to see if there's any grants out there. The, the other side of it is, you know, if you're still budgeting to replace over years, it's still going to have to be money put aside each year. So it would be the differential between what it would cost you annually um, with increased service costs. Um, I'm just throwing a number. I'll say there's forty, fifty thousand dollars for increased staff to or equipment and such each year to maintain a grass field. And it's a hundred thousand, so you now you're looking at another fifty thousand over and beyond that. You would, I would be recommending you put something aside each year, so we're not having to experience the cost of interest in, in issuing debt. But again, um, I think grants play a important role of this as well. As far as renting out the field, the, the problem that we've run into is that the majority of the use is with. The board of education first you know for for their programs that that's the number one use then we have the athletic leagues who do pay their fair share and they've been very good with making their payments each year they take up the next section of time which leaves very little other open time to be able to rent that field out and um, then you know you have places like UConn you know, creating their own new fields where we were for a while renting out the field to them to share with them. Um, you know, a lot of those opportunities aren't there. We tried to sell some advertising on the signs that generated some money and any type of money that we were able to get from any sort of rentals um, after paying for the expenses of managing the field and what we would need for the potty things of that sort, um, that all got applied to the debt to ease, you know, the impact of it having to hit the general fund budget. So there really, there was very little, right, as there it was. was. So, you know, there's not that many other <coughs> revenue opportunities here. So it, you know, it's a choice on, on what the citizens would want and if they're willing to pay for it, if they want an artificial turf, then they have to understand what it would cost to continue that curve. Um, if, if the choice is to do a grass field, then they have to understand there's going to be times that they just won't be able to use the field. There's trade off either way. 
No. Thank you, Councilor Chair. Councilor Felucci, followed by Jacob. Thank you, um, Brenda Felucci here. Um, I say we have some excellent problems in this town if we have so many kids participating in so many sports that they're having trouble finding space, that we're wearing out our fields. Um, I think it's an, an excellent problem to have in a way. Um, to have all these kids so active, I'm thrilled for it. And it's not just the student athletes, it's the families that are involved. So um, I think this is an, a wonderful service that we provide for our community, both the school and the community at large. Um, I think that this, you know, we're talking so much about, do we need, we don't know what this, what the residents want. Well, by the enrollment in all of these different types of sports, I think it's pretty clear that the, we can see that they want these fields. They want to be able to participate in these sports. Um, and just goes to show we really need a strategic plan that would have the community needs assessments involved so that we would know these. Just mute yourself, Councilor Blue, my uh, keep on chair in there. Yeah, I saw that come up. Thank you. So um, I, I just, we talked, a, a lot of my questions were answered, but we didn't talk about snow too much. There was a little bit of information about um, how to do snow removal on in um, an artificial turf, you know, basically plastic shovels. Um, but we didn't talk about what the impacts of snow were to grass. Um, and if there's more information to add about snow removal for artificial turf that wasn't in the packet, that would be great so that we could do a comparison there. We've had multiple inches of snow as early as the middle of October and as late as mid-April. Um, and there are sports that are played in those um, those months, of course. So if somebody can, you know, give us a little bit of insight um, on the impact of snow on grass and turf and what the pros and cons are of each, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 I can, I can chat about snow removal on on synthetic turf it it obviously can be done um it has to be done you know carefully um there is equipment that that can do that beyond a shovel um there are you know uh you know working with the specific manufacturer and identifying equipment and or the the guides that need to be on the equipment to not affect the turf not making very sharp turns with your equipment on the turf so that you tear the, the fabric. Um, I, you know, there are snow plows that basically have a PVC pipe on the blade to not affect the turf. Um, once the turf is, is visible to the sun, it doesn't take long for it to melt off. Um, it doesn't mean that it won't be hard um, because you know it, it's still water and sand and rubber um, and it, um, you know, you can get water in the stone and it can freeze pretty hard, you know, pretty readily from that perspective. So it is possible. It has to be done carefully and it has to be done with the correct equipment um, to maintain your warranty. As it relates to grass, snow on grass, that's exactly what it is, just like your front yard. Um, when, it, uh, when it snows, covers up the grass. And then when it melts, you can play on the grass again, but uh, unless you have boots on. Um, you're not going to plow your grass field uh, or remove the snow from your grass field. Uh, it would it would definitely damage that field uh, from that perspective. And I don't know, Scott, if you have anything further on that, but that's, that's our take. No, in, in uh, my experience, uh, watching um, watching my youngest son play lacrosse, they did have different times where every kid was handed a plastic shovel and they For started sure. from one sideline and went to the other but uh, when it came time to yeah, <laughs> when it came time to using a uh, a, a plow um they were that was very rare and i can speak from experience when you tr do try to plow off grass there are going to be high spots in the grass where all of a sudden it's a dirt spot it's no longer grass and uh you know there, there's virtually nothing you can do to control that um yeah, and I, and I will add on the synthetic turf side of plowing and or snow blowing, 
you will remove rubber and sand in that scenario as well. And it will pile up where the snow piles up. And when the snow melts, all that needs to be dragged back into the field and, and room back in. So there is some, some maintenance as well. I didn't mention that, I apologize. I, I guess a, a follow up on that and maybe, I, I don't know that we have any coaches on here or anything. Um, I, I assume most, most sports still do play if there is a snow covered field. Um, is there any, I, I assume baseball wouldn't, but I don't know. Um, is there any drawbacks to playing? Uh, does it increase the wear and tear? Obviously, I, I believe on grass it would, um, but does it increase the wear and tear playing on a snow covered field for the synthetic? Anytime you play on a plastic fiber, that's, you know what I mean? That's going to be in cold weather, or in snow, I uh, just like plowing it. It's not, it's not, it's something that can be done. It's something that can be done and not void your warranty, but it, but it does wear on your turf from that perspective. <laughs> Almost every university plows their field um, because they have to lacrosse starts February 9th. Um, and they have to plow their fields if you're going to play lacrosse in the Northeast. So, um, so they're plowing or snow blowing their fields, um, from, you know, Maine to Virginia, um, to, to be able to, to be able to play that sport. Uh, obviously during the football season, you can get a, you can get a spit of snow and they'll typically play on it. Not necessarily needs to be plowed, but in early February, there's fields that are snow covered and a lot of. A lot of universities will actually plow that field even though they're not playing on it because it becomes very difficult to remove that snow in February um, as opposed to doing it as it snows. Um, so they'll actually plow those fields all year long, even though potentially people aren't playing on it. Thank you. I appreciate all that input. Sure. Thank you, Councilor Lucy. Jacob? Thank you. I've got a couple of comments and a question. So first, I completely agree with Tammy and uh, Ms. Hancock that whatever we do, we should be putting money away for future replacement cycles. I hope whatever agreement that we come up with for this field includes those terms for future replacement cycles, and it should be as much cash on hand versus bonding. Um, in terms of grants, I know you mentioned that um, is there, I know we don't have a grant writer, we're still looking for that, but do you feel that there's a very good chance we could get some grants, or is this more open? At this point, I don't know what's out there. Okay. So there, there could be um, the outdoor recreational uh, program with the state, but I'm not sure if they have any anything that they're funding. I'm not sure. First, would you have any information on any recreation grants that might be available? First, I think. Um, I'm not quite sure, but I have no problem reaching out to the um, Connecticut Recreation Parks Association to see if um, our executive director knows anything that is uh, currently available or if she knows of anything that um, may be upcoming in the near future. That would be helpful if you could. I, I think in the past there would be the outdoor recreation program that was called Okay. There was some funding, but right now I'm not aware of any, but certainly I haven't had time to be able to yeah. try to look. I just think it'd be useful to figure out exactly how much of a chunk you could count on if we decided to go down the route of keeping a turf field. Um, the second question is um, if we were, if we do decide to keep the turf field, um, would we be able to put any money towards? that field out of pocket, or we, we have to for the entire thing. Um, Currently, it, we probably would have to bond it. You, you want to put it over the life of the asset. Yeah. Um, and bonding right now, the rates are lower than you know, even leasing. I, I, I could certainly look at a lease purchase also. But um, with, with our, our general fund balance, we, we have to keep that at a certain level. And we do use some of those funds each year to offset the mill rate um, so that it's not too much of a big burden on the taxpayers. 
try to relieve some of the burden. That's a better way to say it. So we, we would certainly have to look to see where our fund balance is, if, if that's an option. Um, we've got some major hits coming with our capital out in the future. Um, the, the increase on the, the debt for the water pollution control plant, things like that. A lot of that's taking up a lot of what the general fund tax dollars would put into to funding that. So uh, we, we can look at it. But right now, there's so many other things that are pressing and having to keep our our rating. If we want to keep that AAA rating with the amount of debt that we have forthcoming in the next four to five years is close to about 18 million, 20 million dollars. Um, you know, it's imperative to keep that uh, that bond rating in the AAA to keep the lower interest cost. And it's, it's a concern, you know, I don't, luckily I've just said it's not a horrible time to be borrowing money, but it's, it just doesn't feel like a great option given the, the lifespan sure. of the field. Sure, and yeah. like, I, like I mentioned earlier, um, one of the scenarios it, it includes it, but at a shorter um, time span. Most of our bonds go for 15 to 20 years depending on the life of the asset. And that one is a shorter amortization period. So it certainly would have a higher impact on that as well, but less interest cost. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, Jennifer, and then I actually had a couple of questions after you. Yeah, my question was for Mr. Saba. You mentioned the concern for increased injuries if we extended the life of the current field for too long. I was wondering if you could expand on that. Peter, are you still there, Peter Sukaba? You want Jennifer from one again? My question, then go back to you, Peter. Oh, no, there he is. There he is. No Sorry, guys. Can you repeat that uh, question, though, please? Mention the concern for increased injuries if we extended the lifespan of the field too long or, or with patching. I was wondering if you could expand on that. That's a concern for me for students. So Lou, Lou or Brenda, do you guys mind uh, repeating her a question? Because I just could not hear, hear her because I'm uh, driving. She wants to know if there's any uh, increase in sport. She's concerned about your comment regarding the uh, increase, possible increase in sports industry in injuries. Holy moly. <laughs> you can say that here. If we do uh, any patches or anything like that. Did you hear that? Yeah. So um, patches themselves um, are typically used uh, more so for. I mean, obviously, tears mostly uh, that become tripping hazards and so on. Um, that's the biggest concern is uh, looking for uh, tears and, and sections of the field that actually end up pulling up or, or they start rolling or bunching. Uh, those, those are actually physical tripping hazards. Uh, what I was kind of talking about was uh, the overall um, rating of the field in regards to the fibers capacity to hold the rubber process on under heat, which is really where you get your GMAX ratings from. So as the fiber thins out, it, it actually becomes more like the miracle field in, in a way where you have more of a a synthetic turf with uneven base or rubber pellets in there, which is going to be your your biggest risk if, if it starts to cover a large percentage of the field itself. So we have not seen any sort of of of, of stats from kids being injured, more so this year versus a couple of years ago. Uh, the other thing is too the lifespan of our field in essence may have been increased slightly just because of COVID. When COVID first came out, a lot of sports were kind of cut, cut down. 
So we did pick up a little extra time that would have been where, um, but no, we're, I'm, I'm not seeing anything from a stats uh, per perspective that would lead me to believe that uh, we can't get away with some repairs in some areas, but we still need the plan to replace that field. In reality, I would be surprised if you got another three to four years out of that. And that would be really kind of putting it to, to the very end here. You know, and to the point where, you know, we may have to increase grooming um, because we would have so much displacement the last couple of years that you just have to groom that field a lot more frequently. Thank you, Jennifer. So I have a couple of questions for, um, probably for Scott. The first would be the tractor that's mentioned in the packet that's used to maintain the field. What is the status of that tractor? Is it used for any other purposes uh, outside of that field maintenance? No, that's... Uh... That's its primary function. I mean, obviously, if we had another one of our vehicles go down where we needed it, it's uh, available to us. But it's uh, once you get that set up so that it's uh, grooming the way you like it to, we try to keep it specifically just at the high school. Okay, so probably you would say that it's probably in fairly good condition, so it's not uh, in need of replacement, or what would you expect the timeline for that as a separate procurement? For the yeah, that's... Uh, from from what I saw, Steve, that that tractor's probably got, I would say, at least another ten years easily because it's it's that's primarily all it's been used for, and it's kept under shelter up there. Thank you, Scott. And then I guess as a follow up, if we were to switch back to a natural grass field, would that then, as a result, probably expedite or increase the use of your other equipment, which on the capital budget cycle would then require replacement sooner rather than later? Yeah, what happens is, especially out on athletic fields, we try to use a specific mower to, um, you know, that we keep. Uh, it, it's not like mowing uh, an open area with um, zero turns and, and what have you. Our, our zero turns are kept in good shape. We use those on our soccer fields, like at uh, uh, Cross Farms and what have you. But when it comes to a, a school like that, um, a lot of times we'll actually cut the grass twice just to keep it, you know, whether it's striping or what have you, so that uh, um, there aren't many clippings on there. And like I mentioned before, if there is clippings, we go out with, uh, usually it's a, a tractor mounted leaf blower, blow the grass off. And then we start again with the line painting and what have you, but just for, uh, um, you know, comparison, the, athletic fields that we have in town when we send one person out it takes um typically 20 25 hours to do one round of paint that doesn't include that high school field that high school field by itself like i say is going to take probably close to 16 to 18 hours for uh mowing painting cleaning um, things of that nature. Okay, thank you, Scott. And the last question I would be for Lisa, if we were to explore an avenue of purchasing or procuring any patchwork stuff to extend the life for an additional year or so, what would we use as an as a expenditure method? We, we would probably need a bond for that. It's only at most $8,000. Would it just be in general? No, just be part of our general taxation, general budget, general budget. Okay. And in that. Okay, thank you. If anyone else has questions, just want to open up to anyone who hasn't spoken yet and then go for a second. Yeah. Thank you for asking about the machine. <laughs> I was curious that myself. Um, Lisa, you had mentioned in the beginning, Dana, I don't hear about you. Um, you mentioned in the beginning that we got some initial farms and grants um, for that. Can you speak to where those came from? Sure. We got a steep grant from the state of Connecticut 
which was about half a million dollars. And then uh, the other grant that I was talking about from uh, DEEP, the Department of Environmental Protection, um, that was another 200,000 from them. And that was that recreational one. I think that's the one associated with DEEP. So 700,000 alone in grants, we issued 300,000 in bonds. And um, we also had another $70,000 grant that got reneged on. Um, it was sort of fraudulently approved. And the town ended up having to come up with $38,340 out of basic um, other funds that, that we had to allocate towards that. When, when we found out that that grant was not going to be funded, I put an immediate stop to the project regarding any other things that had to be spent to it. And um, the total amount needed to complete it at that point without adding anything extra was that 38,000. So, and you said steep, right? Was steep, one of the major yeah. ones? Um, in looking at I don't know, but that's used for new constructions and replacement. Yeah, I don't know if it would be allowed for replacement, but this was because it was a new construction um, situation. Yeah, I don't know if we'd be able to replace with that. Right. And then, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, then I think it was, I'm not sure who mentioned the annual um, sanitizing at the field, the annual service. Mm -hmm. What's the cost of that annual service? Scott, do you know the number off the top of your head for that service to sanitize the field? Yeah, it's uh, approximately forty-five hundred dollars. Thank you. You think forty-five hundred or $4,500? i am sorry, I couldn't hear you. Four thousand five hundred. Or yes, yes, four thousand five hundred dollars. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? We're going to wrap this up. Okay, just a quick one. Um, this is a question for Dr. Willard or maybe Bruce. Do we do we know a, a trajectory um, for how much usage the field might get over the next ten years? Because I could I could probably pull up um, or I could ask uh, you know the president of Little League. You know, hey, in 2010 we had this many kids. How do how many do we have in 2013, 15, uh, 17, every and, and so on? So do we do we have an estimate? For how much activity the, the field's going to get over the next 10 years, or do we not have that type of number? Well, I mean, I'll let Bruce comment on the, on the town's assignment of, of activities, but the, essentially everything you see in the sports schedule that has to do with that, you know, with that football trip, that it's going to be uh, you know, here to or in perpetuity of how it's going to be used, whether it's a turf field with organic or, a, or uh, an artificial field. So, thank you. I'll say, James? Yes, thank you. Okay, no problem. Is there anyone else for the first go around who has a chance to speak or ask questions? I wasn't sure if Bruce was going to. Oh, Bruce, sorry. That. You want know, the time for the town? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can pull that up easily on our, our um, recreation management system. Um, but you can pretty much guarantee Monday through Friday from approximately 6.30, 6, 6 um, when we have access to the turf field. Um, until 8.30, approximately 9 o'clock um, from the spring, straight up through fall, really, um, you're going to have a team on there using it, whether it's Tonlin Youth Soccer, uh, the lacrosse, um, and or when we're hitting like the, you know, the fall, winter season, you got football out there. Um, and then you got your miscellaneous games uh, and or tournaments, uh, on the weekends, you know, football will use it in the fall, um, approximately for 10 to 12 hours on a Sunday for five, uh, straight weeks to get their season in at the turf field. Thank you. Is there anyone for a second round regarding the artificial turf placement projects? So what is the aim? Like we're just discussing today. Yeah, there's no action desire. It's just an ongoing discussion, information gathering between the boards, the town. 
Okay, I'm assuming that's something <laughs> that's going to be when we talk about our capital plan that we're going to discuss this more because I'm assuming we would need yeah. info from the Board of Ed to be able to make that decision then. Yeah, and I would absolutely encourage if any questions come up after this meeting to communicate them to the chair and vice chair in the Board of Ed or the council to then relay to count staff that can provide answers to the full council and for the full Board of Ed. <laughs> oh. I'm sorry, Steve, could you repeat that? I didn't hear you. I, I was just saying that this is just a matter of discussion and that if there are any additional questions regarding the turf field after the discussion is concluded, if you want to relay them to the chairs of, and vice chair of the board of Editor council to then pass on to the town staff, they can provide a response that could then be uh, communicated to the full council and full board of Editor. Thank you. Um, so we have already submitted our proposed capital budget. Should we amend it or are we going to discuss it? I guess when you uh, discuss your capital budget, I guess, and there are kind of requests. Yeah, no, okay. I, yeah. I think it's good for now. Unless Lisa is getting into that. The capital budget for this particular item for the artificial turf has been included in on the town side of the capital. So it wasn't in the Board of Education capital request but it is in the town and I think it's two years out. It's not next year's budget, but the budget after that where it's included um, as part of the capital budget. And when, I'm sorry, I should probably notice, when is the timeline for when you'll be approving the capital budget? We, I'm going to release it to the town council sometime next week uh, um, from my initial capital request going through. Um, it could be changed right through, I think it's uh, February 10th is when it will be put out a public, uh, public hearing, a public presentation of that particular budget. But the final budget overall is approved with the overall referendum of the budget and the town council moving forward after they do their deliberations first. Uh, then what goes to the public for the overall goals we're looking at the spring that right so far is truly my only concern is i feel like we're kicking the can down another six months you know and you know i think we need a long-term plan um sooner rather than later because i do feel like we've been discussing this now for a year <laughs> not longer i don't know kind of covid Timing is made things confusing, but up. so that's my only concern. I don't know if it's something that the town council can discuss sooner, or if it's something that we really won't really have an answer until let's even say March, April, um, because then we really not figured out a plan, and that was I think what the board when we wanted this joint meeting, we wanted to kind of get a plan in place. So that that's my only concern. Thank you, Christine. And then just as a point of note, if you do want to see the full schedule section, I think the finance department's website for the 2022 to 2023 budget schedule. Um, so it doesn't go ahead and the capital budget public hearing is on it's February. February yeah. So by, by February, cap, we should have a firm decision of where we want to head with the capital. And again, you know, things deliberate through the budget process and get changed, they get changed, but that'll be what's going on. Fourth for the budget. Thank you. 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 Thank you Prefer grass or turf, and possibly. Yeah, I mean, I, I think at least for discussion purposes, it's good to get that information from each board of board of education member. They have general thoughts and other recommendations and thoughts from the police office, but this is generally an open forum to get opinions and ideas from everyone. Okay. So yeah, if anyone wants to go around, if they want to, if they have an opinion right now, feel free. Yeah, I mean, I can sum up what my basic thoughts are. I think give about sixty percent of it, but. Um, I think, again, we should look up into grants um, to get more specific information. Uh, definitely put forward a long-term plan for replacement cycles if we decide to keep the turf field, which I would like if we could do that. Um, that's where I'm leaning at the moment, although I understand it's 
a complex decision. Um, and either way, it will affect educational programs and various things like that. Um, and if we can put any money towards paying for it now, that would be preferable. Uh, so I think that's something that is worth researching. Two cents. Thank you, Jacob. If there's any other board of education members that would like to, otherwise, you are welcome to also contact the council via email if you haven't made a firm decision yet. It would be still be more information to make a final decision. It's obviously February 10th as well state, so it is time to further deliberate and gather information. I'll go. Um, <laughs> since nobody else. Um, I do want to say that even with turning it to the synthetic turf to the natural grass, you're still looking at 670000 It's not free to just rip it off and get rid of it. Um, I, I mean, I was kind of going through this, and I don't know if these kind of answer your questions, though, Tammy, because it does have an automatic irrigation system, so I'm assuming that they're going to have to put a new one in. It sounds like they're going to have to do a new subgrade, the stone, the sand base, which, you know, I guess there's a different sand base that that uses. Um, the sod, and then the football and gold post, which I don't know if that's in there, but it's in there. <laughs> so, you know, I still look at this and I still say it's not free just to rip it up and turn it into grass. I do think having the synthetic turf for our students, it is a, you know, there are many plus sides to it where all students can use it and do have one for at least our community. We have a lot of grass fields and, you know, whether the soccer team can use X, Y, Z, but they can't when it rains, you know, maybe perhaps they can use this field instead. I don't know how the scheduling goes. So I do have to say that with all the sports, Talon is a very big sports town. <laughs> I think that is a consideration when looking at everything and you're still, like I said, I still see if you turn it to grass, you're still looking at the you know, 670,000, then you're still talking. It seems like there's more maintenance, whether it's the different paints, which the patches on the field itself that happens, it almost looks like it's like a shag carpet that's on top for the lines. I don't know what you mean. I looked through the pictures that you had posted in there, and it just kind of looks like it's on top and however they sew it in. I don't know how the patches would go, if there would be more injuries, if it does pack down or not, because I like the idea of making it last a little bit longer. I mean, it may not look pretty, but you know, it's, it's functional. I just don't know if we patch that area, if that then in turn makes everything else around that patch cave in or go separate ways. I don't, I'm not a turf expert. I don't know. <laughs> but those are thoughts that I had, you know. If we can make it last longer, that would be great. But is it feasible and does it make sense? Because the last thing we do need is having students getting injured. But if we can patch it and they have a little seamless and they just go around and pop it in and mold it in, <laughs> make it level and everything's fine, then maybe that is something we can consider. Um, those are all kind of my thoughts through this whole conversation. Um, I think I got everything I explored a lot. And I do agree with the grants. We need to look at grants. Mm -hmm. we, we need to see whatever we can find to get some help. Um, I like the 10 year, if we have to bond versus 20 year, because you can't bond for something that's not really long. And I don't know if there's a way, this is kind of like an out of the box thinking, but I was looking at this track respray resurfacing, which is about 120,000 to 225 that we resurfaced. Dr. Willow, when we do the tracks, is there like something along the lines that we can do for these repairs on the actual turf too? Or are they like a separate? Yeah, I mean, he can speak to that. My impression is they're separate. They're separate, you know. But they can't just because it kind of, when you're reading it, and it says that they take it, build up a little track, and then they put a binding surface, and then they put the rubberized liquid on top with the five to eight with the thickness and sprinkling rubberized. I mean, I know that's different than the turf, but is that a way that we can repair with the patches somehow? Like, Yeah, my impression, because the track and that is for that track running, whereas the field is for that the sports with the cleats and so on, it's a little bit, it's just different. That's my impression. Okay, because I so, don't like that. Yeah. The whole um, I'm sure people could comment to that more, but um, but that's my impression is it's a, it's a different process. So, I mean, there may be some dovetailing of grouping projects together, um, but that is, those are two separate types of expenses. 
in the back. And I will say that our student representatives did speak at our last board meeting and they were very pro people with turf. Um, they say that the gym classes use it, the students have to go outside, and it's a amazing kind of path to get in. So that was a thought of the question. That's it. I appreciate you. Christina, you, your name is up. Um, I got two quick things, all on board with grants. Um, <laughs> completely on board. Second thing is taking the numbers out of it in spring. I'm in, a, I'm in an interesting situation here as a little league coach. In spring, when you know it rains overnight, you walk, you expect the next day, hey, I can go to the field with three coaches, fix up the field, and we can play. That's for about I don't know. 60 by 60 by 60, whatever the math is there. That's for the infield. It is not easy to replace or fix the outfield necessarily because there's no, we don't have grass patches. We don't have this, we don't have that. And so taking, again, taking the numbers out of it, just solely to be like turf or to be like dirt more. Turf is definitely my preference uh, as a board member, but as also a coach, um, just because it is a lot less work for volunteers. It's a lot less work for those. Uh, it's a lot less on their, that's their plate. We're already contracted to the town of Holland. So um, just taking the numbers out of it, again, I am on board with turf. But grants, I am all on board with grants. Yes. Thank you, Christina. Well, I'm sure I'd say a few things. Um, Thinking about the turf field in general, like I, I wasn't around when it was voted on, or if I was, if I wasn't paying attention. Um, it might not have been something I would have voted yes on putting in, knowing the financial consequences. But since it's here, you know, I'm also a big fan of take, you know, taking care of our things, you know, <laughs> um, you know, and prolonging their life. And it's, it's apparent that the board does use this turf field an awful lot. Um, and I know it's not for the part of the board budget, but if our students feel strongly and we feel strongly, uh, I feel like the board could contribute uh, something to support the cost. Uh, and I speak as a member, as a member of the board, and not for the whole board. Uh, but that was, those are just my thoughts. Thank you, Christina, Jennifer, and then Sophia. Um, I just want to say it does look like um, the Steve Grant can be used for expansion, renovation, or replacement. That's good news. That's good news um, and then to what Ashley was saying about the rain, you know, I can speak from just my own personal time with my boys playing football. That's exactly what happened. When it rained, everybody moved over to, to the high school field and they practiced together so that they didn't lose that practice time. And I think once we even moved one of the championship games from another town to back to ours so that they could actually have that day because they were able to use the turf field and they weren't able to use the other field. Um, and then I guess I would say that, yes, I, I agree. I think that we should definitely keep the, the turf field if we can, and we should definitely pursue grants. And I do think that we should pursue grants before we talk about taking any board of ed funds away, especially anything that would be, you know, COVID relief related, anything that would be with loss of learning, right? Get that issues or so on. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah. I just wanted to add that I think um, this, this artificial turf field also adds value to our town. Our town is more marketable. It has a nicer field. People may move to our town just knowing about our athletic program. Additionally, I, I think what's more important here is what we're not talking about and that the plan for the funding of the artificial field or if we go sad, is not being talked about and we need to, we need to plan for the future proactively so our predecessors aren't facing this themselves. Thank you, Sophia. And actually that just makes me think another thing for Lisa possibly want to work with Bruce. It might be worthwhile since we had similar stakeholder input for the potential miracle field that's still being discussed, that we may want to work with some of those teams outside of the board of ed and the town to get their input on their preference submitted to council as well as to the board of ed. So we got a holistic picture of how many stakeholders really appreciate the, the artificial field compared to a uh, natural grass field. Is there anyone else for a second round of discussion, questions, comments? That's not our okay. um, I have no trouble with the place too. So, 
I know Mr. Weaver um, mentioned about something about <laughs> um, I actually, how many times what I've read, we've only really had to go back and fix it. We had to use the warranty. Like, is it something that we I think it was just once? Do we know? Is it something that was a little concerned if we had to continue to fix it that that would be possible? Or is that something that we have a lot to have to do a lot of repair on? Um, I'll let Scott address that, but I think we only had one more yeah, thing in the whole time, and, uh, and it was covered under the okay. warranty. Um, so it's not something that happens uh, often. Scott, have you had any other major repairs that you had to do <coughs> to that field? No, I, I believe you're correct. Uh, um, we had uh, one warranty issue. Uh, we did have a small one a couple of years ago, and uh, our operations manager reached out to uh, the contractor. It was uh, some an area around the drainage was lifting, and they came in and they made the repair under warranty. But um, we really haven't had anything in the six year other than that in the six years that I've been here. Um, and then, what would it take to either in the grass field or a turf field. You know, how long would it What did you say? Like if you redo the grass, the grass field versus a turf field, how long would it take to redo? Like I would assume it would take away time from sports. Certainly. Jonathan, do you have, could you respond to that? Uh, the question was, how long would it take to do, you know, to convert it to a grass field and how long would it take to put a turf field replacement in, um, how much time does it take away from the use of those fields, of the field? Sure, sure. So I, I, you could replace the synthetic turf in, in, in probably six weeks. Uh, you know, depending on when you procure the material, things of that nature. So you procure the material well in advance of them actually mobilizing to the site, demo, demoing the existing turf, um, and then installing the new. Uh, they will have to, you know, regrade the base slightly uh, to make things flat again and um, graded properly uh, for for the specific use. Um, the grass field is probably going to take uh, between the demolition and the and the rebuilding of that is going to probably take three months. Uh, may take a little bit longer. Um, but what the time is going to be in what grass service you choose. Um, sod is going to take six weeks before you can even think about starting to play on it, um, making sure that it roots in uh, and is healthy. If you seed it, you'll probably lose a year um, to make sure that, it's, uh, that, it, that it comes in well um, and is healthy before you start tra trampling it down uh, right away. So... Um, there, there's definitely multiple timelines, but the synthetic turf being that your base and drainage is already installed, your base would need to be cleaned up slightly. Um, and you know, the turf is like putting carpet down. They'll typically install the turf within with, with about three weeks. Um, so there's some time for demo, some time for cleaning up the base and then installation of it. Just to, uh, just to add to that. The, um, in my history, when you plant a grass field, the first year, yes, it looks nice, but it doesn't have the resiliency to it that it would have after a year and a half to two years. You start playing on it it's, when it's real uh, immature, those, those roots are going to rip out of the, uh, the soil pretty quick. That's for sure. And, it, and it's very weather dependent from that perspective of a very wet summer is going to take long, longer for the grass, very hot summer. Uh, there, it's definitely weather dependent on how long it's going to take the root in and be playable for sure. Scott, good point. Um, I'm definitely with any others about applying for the grants. I think that's an obvious thing to do. I'm just concerned why hasn't there been any planet for the future of this turf already or the rest? Like, are we saying we haven't planned for what's happening right now before? No, we, we have had it in the capital plan for the past uh, year or two regarding the replacements, slowly moving up in the, um, 
the year to be addressed. So they passed it in there. Regarding grants, um, it all depends on what grant you're going for and you know how quick it can be used, things like that. There's usually timing. Yeah, sometimes you it, it all depends on the grant, but sometimes you have to have a shovel ready project to be able to request a grant. Um, very similar to like school construction grants, you have to have the appropriation approved and any bonding approved prior to being able to request a school construction grant. So it, it all depends on what kind of grants are out there. Um, my goal was to, to get it in the process if, if this is what is desired and to try to find whatever grants we could get. Reserve, you know, a cash reserve. Um, we have eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars in the capital plan, um, which currently is identified as bond funding over a ten-year life. That could very well change. Like I said, it's two years out. Um, that could change if, if we're able to secure some grants for it. Again, it's got to be a project that's officially approved. And usually, even though you have a five-year plan, year one is the year that really gets appropriated in the budget and, and moves forward. Um, years two through five can change. Um, so it's a little tricky trying to apply for a grant right now for something that's two years out. Need to be shoveled ready for grants. <laughs> Um, and I, know, or, I honestly think boards are not official for it. makes sense. I mean, why would we go back in time? You know, it costs a lot of money, but listening to our experts, that have been telling us it seems like they even lean a little bit towards each other. I mean, I would think, you know, it costs money up front, but I would think you would save a little bit of money on the other side. Plus, we have short staff, so that would cost a lot more work on our staff as well. Um, I think we have enough time, so that's all. Thank you. So I just wanted to say that I also in support of figuring out a way to fund this. And I think the reason why I'm not sure if I'm a board member or um, Colin, if you even know, the reason why I think this whole thing came about is because in our field and use agreement, which we had to sign back in June, it says the Board of Education and Town of Collins will work collaboratively to come up with a funding method for the turf field replacement. So that's why we were bringing this to the council now to try to start that collaboration. So I'm just hoping that, I, I, like what you said, we'd like to leave here right, right now on I Sunday. Know, I know, but you know, not going to get an answer. Right. I do think that, um, <clears throat> yeah, that's kind of what the purpose was of the joint meeting. So I think the sooner we can figure out that collaboration, the better. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Christina? Oh, Somewhere in here, I can't find it. There was something about a sinking fund. Is that where the 89,000 is? The 89,000 has basically been used to offset the cost of the debt. Okay, so that's... So that money's gone. Um, so is there a sinking fund that... Okay. <laughs> Can we start the sticking fund? <laughs> if we had money to put into it, that would okay. be one of right. That's my fortune. Yeah. Right. Gotcha. Thank you. That's so, in reference to what you two were just saying, that you can't do a sinking fund if we're paying $100,000 a year, because then you're looking at $100,000 a year plus another $100,000 a year put it in the sinking fund to be able to fund the next one. This is the same conversation that we're having with the miracle field is when, you know, how do you replace it? 
So if we want to look at putting some kind of plan forward to put some kind of money in the sanctions fund, the only way to do that is find a way to fund this field up front. Because then you fund it, and then you start saving for the next field. You're, you're funding one, and you're saving for the next 10 years. And the only way that we're going to be able to do that is, as you mentioned, finding some sort of way to collaboratively look between the two boards. And I bring up the ERF fund because the ERF fund is specifically for capital improvements, transportation, and special education. And I believe after the money that goes in there, we're looking at there going to be almost a million dollars in there um, just this year alone, not counting what's going to go in the next two years. So in that line, if we're looking at finding a collaborative way, we need to figure out how much money there is set aside anywhere between your fund and the other funds to be able to fund an $850,000 field. That's ultimately what we need to do if you want to start a banking fund. Because then we fund the first field and we start putting the $15,000 that we get every year from the sports agencies, which is $150,000, that goes into the sinking fund. Any rental fees that Bruce manages to get, as limited as they are, that goes into the sinking fund. And then we look at how we're going to fund it going forward with pay as cash and not bonding. That also, just for frame of reference for everybody, saves us about a 34% compound interest of a million dollars over 10 years. So you're saving about $330,000 by finding a way to fund this now. So ultimately, I think we can't decide that now, but the conversation needs to be, how much money do you guys have? How much money do we have? And how do we fund an $850,000 field with cash out the door? So that's where I would suggest the next meeting goes, whether it goes back to the board and you guys talk about it in finance and we talk about it at town council to look for a matching on each side, unless you guys know of something that's coming up for the ERF fund that you're gonna need a million dollars for between capital, transportation, and special ed. It's a capital project. That would be my suggestion. Thank you, Councilor Luciana. I don't know, if Dr. Rose, you wanted to respond, let's get your hand raised for a moment. No, it's just a technology. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, it's not transportation. It's like the other two are 66%. Technology, yes. <laughs> Um, but again, you know, the, I would I would um, caution against future reliance on uh, structures like the ERF for funding, say, in perpetuity. I think the town has to look at its long term planning and, and what it actually wants to do with fields like this, because these artificial fields, you know, you started with the one at the high school. The miracle field is coming on the radar. That's also on school grounds. So at, at what point is that going to be something that every 10 years, you know, there's the same conversation and, and you know, and it's turning towards that, that can be up to 1.4 million now. We'll also be asking for roofs and things like that. You know, we can run school without an artificial field, but we can't run it without a roof. So, you know, we just have to, you know, look at the town, I think would want to look at way out into the future. Here's your here's your solution for today with what resources you have available to you. But going long term out, you know, these fields, how many of these do you want? Where do you want them? How will you fund them? How will you maintain them? You know, you don't want to arrive at that 10 year point and have everybody in a bloodbath trying to figure out where, where it's supposed to come from. So that's all I would advise. And the only other caution on yeah, right. You know, things like maintenance of effort could be upwards of 400,000. One outplacement on a modest side is 69,000 to 100,000. Um, so even a $900,000 balance is, is nine outplacements for us. You know, so it is it is it is a chunk, but it's also something, you know, that can go really quickly. So just keeping in mind, you know, a solution for now makes sense, but then a long-term plan so that we're not in a position like this again, you know, it also makes sense. And I'm, that's what I would question. Not reliance on a structure like VR, so that fluctuates greatly. Thank you for checking with Dr. Lewis. Uh, David? Really quickly, could those two things be separated? So, a, a, a solution as to um, getting the field passed, so whether it is decided that we go to grass or turf, and then separately, we plan for the 10 year plan for whenever it needs to be replaced again with the turf or whether. The, the, if I guess if we go with grass, there won't need to be, um, a lot, uh, I guess, as much money put into such a plan. So could those two things be separated or do they have to have sort of happen concurrently where if we pass a, for the turf, we also have to pass a plan um, 
just for, for, for 10 years down the road sake, for a plan that sort of pays for it. Well, I mean, you have to, you have to solve your immediate problem, right. Right. Um, which is the turf field now. But uh, I think you, you can do both. In my opinion, you can do both now, and that you can use your other, you know, other groups and committees on, in the town to kind of figure out looking forward how many, again, how many of these bills do you want? Who's going to own them? Where are they going to get budgeted? That's it. Uh, yes, definitely. Jacob and Christine, then I just look at this. Um, just to uh, Snuccio's point um, and Dr. Will's point with the ERF, you know, I absolutely agree. We, we do need to be careful with that, but I don't. I also agree that's not something that should be taboo to talk about. But we are to have a discussion for the part of the ERF. We came out and said we wanted, I think that's reasonable for us to have that discussion within the context that, you know, as Dr. Will is pointing out, there are other things that may need to be funded out of that account. I was basically going to say the same thing there. Okay. <laughs> but, but, and, and as far as what Jaden said, I do think that the second we decide to go forward with this, if we decide to go forward with replacing this term in two years or three years, then at that moment, the 10 year plan has to happen. So, in my opinion, they are absolutely more or less one in the same. So, while I think it's awesome if we can somehow get a grant to cover the initial 850 or however much we can get, we still at that moment have to have our, our plan for the next 10 years because, unfortunately, I think that's what happened in 2013. They had a million dollars of a plan, but nobody thought of 10 years, and here we are. So, we in essence, you know, this council on this board of ed has to come up with what to do about the first replacement and, and in essence what to do about the replacement 12 years from now. So <coughs> my two cents on that, but thank you. I am in agreement with all of them. I agree with what Jamie said too. You know, we need to that that was my point for bringing up the ERF. I agree with Dr. Willett. It can't be a long term thing. We can't say we're gonna use the ERF to fund this ongoing. The intent of it is the first payment, make that payment, and then start the sinking fund. Start how we're going to pay for the next field. How do we pay for the next ten-year field? Because um, otherwise, we're just perpetually looking at hundred thousand dollars a year every year from now until the end of time to to cover the tarp field instead of us being able to plan for it and pay for it. So. Um, I, I agree. I think we need to have some sort of compromise between the Board of Ed and the, um, and the town side to look at how we get this first thing done. I can look to see if there's any opportunity when the budget opens up to put in additional bonding at the state level. Um, I don't know if that's going to happen or not this this go round, but I can look to put in money for that. I don't know how well it will be because we got a million dollars for the fire department with my last go round, but I can see if there's any opportunity for state bonding also, because it is outdoors and it can be linked to outdoor activity, possible COVID-ish stuff at the state level. I do have to find out. But um, again, I agree with I agree with what Jamie and Jacob and Christine said, basically. I'm going to fund the first one and set up a plan so we're not here again in 10 years looking for another bond at 33%. Thank you, Dr. I think uh, what I feel is important here and it's something to touch on is that while we talk tonight, and, and I know we have uh, February is another one of those milestone dates, that we don't stop talking. Um, I think when we mentioned words like plan and grant, um, all of which sound good in the theory, but if we don't get any grants, we still have a problem. You know, and, and if we're, if we're looking at using things like the ERF, then how much money do we need to keep in there to maintain what we need for our students? And what does that mean? So we've got time between now and then to keep having these conversations. Thank you, Tony. Is there any further discussion before we want to agenda item three? Don't want to retell anyone else any one on present? Oh, please. Well, it comes down to the delay in signing of the um, the grounds and maintenance agreement. Although you know the town has been still 
doing the work. <laughs> um, I, I'm just in agreement that I've already, um, the town manager already had authority to go ahead and sign it. Um, I think it was at a council meeting. I don't know if it was in the summer or whatever, but Mike Rosen was authorized to sign it. I held off from signing it because I understand you wanted to have this meeting to discuss things, as you had mentioned, Griffin, um, about working in conjunction to get, uh, cooperatively together on the turf field ideas and things like that. Um, so at this point, do Dr. Willett and I sign that contract that we're pretty much abiding by on the town side, and I think the board is as well, doing what you know was required to do, um, which has been worked out together in the past. I'm saying Ken because we voted yes on the field and ground agreement mm -hmm. contingent on this meeting. I think we could go back to the minutes, but um, that would be my guess. <laughs> okay, so then we were just in non compliance for a little bit. Because really, we should have taken place whatever the date was that we had signed. It. Okay, so then Dr. Willett and I will proceed with just finalizing everything. But we both wanted to make sure since you had your caveats, and we'll take care of it. Okay, is that just to clarify? Is that a formal vote from the council as well, or is that just a it, it's already been, I just I just wanted to make sure everybody was comfortable with us signing it. So a straw poll, whatever, however you want to handle it. We've all, I already have the authority yeah. that you granted up for me. Yeah. Well, Mike Rosen, but it's a town manager. It's up to you. I want to handle that. I don't see any strong objections unless anyone has an issue. It says contingent on yeah. us working together. Yeah, so so I, I, think, I think this is the yeah. first, first big step. So I would say. As long as you're all ahead. comfortable with it, then we can sign it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, one more question. It's for not Dan. a monetary question. It's, okay. it's a safety question. I'm sorry to ask it earlier. Um, but are there significant uh, pros and cons uh, via a turf field versus a grass field safety wise for our athletes? Overall, what do we find a safer environment? I guess, if you will. I don't know if that's for Peter, Mr. Rochester. I would, uh, it seems though we handle most of the maintenance part. I would have to defer to uh, Jonathan being the professional in the, uh, the field division as to what he has seen um, more injuries on, whether it's grass or the artificial turf. Yeah, I, I, I think there's there's some differing opinions and you know you you can read in one way or the other uh as it relates to injuries uh some coaches think that synthetic turf you know has has greater injury on the athlete where other coaches believe that the natural grass um um had it being not a controlled surface um is uh is worse for the athlete so there, there's, there's definitely differing of opinions um, as it relates to that. I am not an injury specialist. Um, we, we develop, you know, we definitely develop surfaces that are safe, and the surfaces, whether they're synthetic or natural grass, would be safe, and they meet the the requirements of the of the industry um, as as it relates to either of those surfaces. Um, you know, I, I think it was reported here today that there was no increase in injuries over the over the life of the of the turf thus far, or no reporting that has indicated such. Um, therefore, I you know I, I I just read that as that that you know there's there's no one complaining of of a specific injury that's being caused by synthetic turf. Um, there is some studies out there that say, you know, practicing on synthetic turf and going to natural grass or vice versa can have an effect on, on athletes. Um, but, uh, I would really, I would really want your athletic trainer to, to weigh in on that more than, uh, just the person designing the surface. Like I said, the surface is designed to meet all the industry standards, whether that be GMAX, Hicks, things of that nature. 
um, uh, and the natural grass surface is similar to that. Thank you. Okay. Do you also have a hand? Counselor, do you have one more question? Yeah, I would just say, Daniel, there is a lot out there to be with, especially a soccer player, uh, especially for girls. ACL, MCL, and concussions are significantly worse on turf fields than they are on grass. Um, you know, it's a faster right. surface of play. Right, that's yeah, right. It's quicker. And in the winter, that entire surface underneath freezes so much harder. Concussion injury is major. And um, ACL, MCL tears are higher on turf than they are. No, that's what I'm talking about because right? the speed of it, right? It's pretty much the same, right? It's ACL, MCL concussions are worse on turf. And not only that, our turf, which was top of the line turf when we got it in 2012, it was not a mid level. It was the top of the line turf. The rubber pellets that are in it are carcinogenic. They're torn up tires. So, the point out there is also thinking like not only the physical aspect, right? Yeah. And the speed of the sport, but any, any other. Any yeah. other, uh, you know, you can bring, chemicals and whatever that's right. in there. You can bring you the inversely right. the divots that can be in a regular field. And right. you have football players, not soccer players, and that's different. So and lacrosse too. But I guess I guess there's going to be pros and cons for for both. But yeah, the speed of it and the heart of it. Now, I asked the injury question before, which is why I found it really odd because I personally know at least five people that have been hurt on our turf field with ACL, MCL blowouts, ankle Achilles blowouts, so multiple concussions. And that happens on all turf fields, and you know whether they're FSA's fields or ours or Dio Smith's. So, but there's a lot of people. Who are a lot. Thank you. I didn't mean to derail the financial conversation of this, but I thought it was That's important to see you wrap it. So, thank you. Is there any other discussion? Just want to leave it open to everyone. And Councilor Luber, Councilor Lucy, are you all set before we move on to agenda item three? All set. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All set. Thank you. We see so in that event, we'll move on to agenda item three. Joint discussion with Town Council Board of Education regarding the COVID relief fund. Uh, Lisa or Dr. Wolf, do you have any items summary and any additional comments? I will turn that over to Dr. Wolf. Sure. So um, the school system, like everybody, has had uh, you know quite a difficult year um, from the standpoint of. You know, logistics, um, managing things, keeping everybody safe, educated, and healthy. Um, and so last year, we paid a pretty big price in human capital with the amount of um, modifications and heavy lifting that we had to do. You know, and everybody had to do it with respect to quarantines. It affected all the families. It affected every virtual workspace in the United States and the world. Um, and so for us, it meant a series of impactful and cascading quarantines for kids. Um, and even though we were in school, uh, we were one of the districts that was in for many more days than most of the other districts with most of our kids in. We did run almost an entire separate school system for a while of about 400, say, kids at its maximum, almost an entire building, if you would think about it that way. Um, of kids in a you know in a in a remote program of their choosing, so the year had extreme complication. Um, the logistics that we had to do were, were, were incredible, and um, the silver lining in this, if there is any, not that I you know would say there's a silver lining to any pandemic. I wouldn't want to minimize anyone suffering, um, but I do you know. But if one had to look at a bright side. One of the bright sides, so to speak, was uh, there were areas where we did not use resources that um, that would normally be used um, for, you know, due to the dynamics. And this pandemic is constantly changing. Um, the needs that we had last year are not the same needs that we have this year. Uh, the dynamics uh, of the situation, as you've, uh, you've noticed, when you look at it, it's constantly evolved, or the requirements are constantly evolving. So at the end of last year, there were areas where um, we had budget lines that were under because you know the, the dynamics of the pandemic at that time um, did not have us using those resources the same way as, say, we would be using them this year. So, for example, special education tuition is going to try to create a one pager, so to speak, to highlight um, that, you know, here are some of the major areas where we were under budget last year 
and this was the ratio or proportion of you know of that that you know that the overall um, impact. So you know, uh, for instance, special ed tuitions were one of the biggest areas that we were under budget. So you'll notice that was a bigger chunk of the pie here. So knowing that on one pagers graphics are usually helpful. This is designed to give you an extent of the magnitude of, of where that impact fell. So special education tuitions, uh, district paid significantly less. Um, the pandemic impacted services that were not, not provided during that time. Many kids that you know, had actually gone to certain programs were now in remote versions of them. <laughs> So um, these, that allowed us, and uh, the billing was a little different. Um, and open choice participation landed in this line too. So this line uh, ended the year significantly under. Student transportation, again, there were entire blocks of time where buses were not running. 400 children were not being transported during, their, you know, during a, a long period of the pandemic where they were in that remote program. Um, you know, there was a really big underutilization, so that also resulted in, <laughs> as you can see, one of the bigger chunks of the, the pie. Salaries, um, we did not have an athletic supervisor for all intents and purposes. That person became the AP and athletic supervisor to help us through the year. Knowing that, um, you know, we were in a strange year, it didn't make sense to fill that position, so there were things like that that we did. All of these things that I'm describing, though, came with great logistical difficulties for us to accomplish what it took to try to manage it without these programs. So, for instance, we would have much rather had all the buses running for 400 remote children. It was a very difficult situation to deal with. So, um, you know, those salaries also included things like you know, being unable to fill many positions. People were not you know, really super eager to work in classrooms during this time. People that had been, you know, doing it for many years were deciding against that, you know, last year. Nurses were very difficult to find and often they were understaffed there. The nurses have done a phenomenal job. Contact tracing the people that we've had to do it. It's a tough job. People aren't happy when you're reaching out, obviously, they, they wouldn't be. Um, difficult kind of situation to be in. And uh, people just weren't, um, weren't eager to be doing it. So we had people picking up the weight of doing that. Again, the silver lining in that is that there is a chunk of money left over from that year because of it, because of those, those um, efforts and the things that your, you know, your staff was willing to do. So that's 17%, a fairly decent chunk. And then repairs, maintenance, custodial, things like that. Overall, um, you know, when the building wasn't being utilized, there were certain blocks of time where the whole building was remote, our buildings were remote, the district was remote. Um, that didn't require the same level of action in many of these things. And projects that you know, were slated weren't necessarily going to be able to get done. And that also played out in some leftover funds um, or under budget areas. Um, when you have situations where you know people are not, not working or not in the positions that they are anticipated to be in, you also have like a Medicare, Social Security, and other things like that that will be um, you know that will have a remaining balance due to it. Um, retirement, ICMA, although some of that you know was a little higher, other things were not, um, and so that grouping there, that kind of going in a percentage of impact was also um, something that. Uh, resulted in you know, some end of year funds. And of course, the heating and energy, this is part of the UISF agreement. So that's something that you're familiar with. Um, and there was, as you might imagine, some underutilization there because um, there were times when the buildings were just not occupied for a short span of time. <coughs> so that was a really not wonderful year. And um, I think we did, uh, I think the community did an amazing job. The kids did an amazing job. And, um, the federal government, the state government recognized the difficulties that districts across the country were facing. And so you saw the ARC funds, the ARC ESSERS and things like that become available to um, communities. Um, in a variety of ways, they helped communities. Um, the thing to note about these is that they help the communities because the communities need to help. Um, you know, you don't have a pandemic that kills 700 to 800,000 Americans and not have you know, the need to have some help. 
So these ARPs and the ARPessers were provided because we needed to help. Um, and that's, that's both towns side and board side across the country. And so the charts at the bottom kind of color coded as best they could with respect to trying to get it all smashed onto a page for everybody was um, you know, to give you a sense um, of where those funds were utilized and are currently being utilized. Uh, you know, the, the needs of the pandemic are great as you're aware. I think everybody knows what these social, emotional, uh, psychological impacts were, what the family impacts were, families that were you know, vulnerable, were just made more vulnerable by the pandemic. I still hear a reoccurring theme that families are suffering, people are suffering. And a lot of times the conversation starts with something like, you know, well, don't you understand that, you know, dot, dot, dot. And they go on to express a great deal of suffering that people are having. Um, social workers, counselors, um, these are positions that are in place for that reason. Once again, you know, you, you don't have a global pandemic or a situation like this this many people that have perished and these kinds of complications without there being a need to do something. And so through those utilizations, um, these are the kinds of things that needed to happen. One of the, the bigger needs um, you know, that has transferred over to this year, and this year's animal looks different. Um, same species, but looks different for us. It's actually more complicated this year than it was in the past because not everybody is in one category. So when things happen, they happen differently to different groups based on the, the situation that that group uh, is in, or that uh, you know, population that that group is in. So, you know, the nurses have never been more overwhelmed than they are right now, even last year. Personally, I have not been more overwhelmed than I you know, have ever been in my career. In fact, while we were having this meeting, two more COVID positives came in, and I was starting the contact tracing process while we're having the meeting, because if I wait until I get home tonight, it would be nearly impossible for me to catch all those kids and people before we get to school tomorrow. So that's an example that every moment in the day now has become a moment of constant multitasking where you have to split all kinds of efforts, things like that. But the, again, you know, silver lining, so to speak, is that when you go through a situation like last year where the animal looked a little different, it yielded the result of having some funds that were there uh, underused. And the town and its wisdom uh, had created the CRF. Um, and you know the basic language of the CRF, the status of which was to be written between June 1st and September. But the core objective of the CRF was that if there were funds available, uh, that those funds could be utilized across financial year. Whereas if you had a grossly underutilized transportation system one year, but you had this massive need to address learning loss say, in a summer program the next year, you could utilize what you were not able to spend on transportation for the kids that are in the general education population that would normally not have the benefit of that summer program. So the utilization of the funds here is specified in the middle section where at the end of the year, there was a balance of about 796. Um, throughout the process of the board coming to the close of the year, there were a series of documents where there were many discussions over where resources would be allocated where some investments were going to be made in the future. By the way, the budget, as we are starting to work on it now, meeting with departments and going through the process, going over nitty gritty form, what they're asking for, there are many places as we anticipated where the investments that were made to offset the impact of this year now need to be, uh, you know, need to be uh, reinserted. Re re um, special education is up by $400,000 the next year. So as we come out of this past phase of the pandemic, we face new things that the animal has morphed into something different now. And the learning loss is amplified across all groups and populations. And we need to address that, you know, 
it's like what we were given in one hand, you know, then has to taken away in another. This year, you know, we have to do things to address it. So associate educators were also a part of the picture here that as we got into this new wave, where now they're not remote, but they're actually in this quasi form of here, not here. The screen to stay allows kids to be here, but the parents can't get them home. But kids that are not um, that are not contacts in school cannot benefit from screen to stay. So, for instance, half of the children that I will be contacting for tomorrow have no choice; they have to be out. Um, so there's a, a whole bunch of uh, groups that, because of their, you know, their groupings have to be out, or where they got you know, their close contact have to be out. Anything in the community, you're out. Anything in the sports, you're out. Anything in um, pizza parties, birthday parties, or groups and gatherings, you know, Thanksgiving, if you're a close contact during that, you're out. And you're out those 10 days. So these associate educators have to address the learning loss and be tools for the teachers and can, you know, partners with the teachers and addressing the very constantly different needs of the kids in the classroom because of these fluctuations, but also have to be able to reach out to the families at home who are often now struggling what to do. Now they can't go to work. You can't, you know, which one of us won't go to work tomorrow because we have to be here um, with you know, little Walter and um, that's going to create an issue for us in our days, in our sick days, in our work days, and what kinds of days do we use, and an income implication potentially. Um, and we need help, and the associate educators you know, provide that um, both for kids in the class that are going to need some assistance as they go through it and kids that are at home. So even though we morphed screen to stay for certain populations, the, there's still these mixed groups in and out all the time, constantly. Um, and over the break that was four days long, we had at least two to three COVID identifications putting out um, a variety of kids in a variety of ways. Um, so these associate educators are really our flexible groups that we meet constantly between schools and between populations um, to cover uh, the issues that arise. Also, in the summer, um, we were able to and put together some program. The cost of that program, if I put it in a budget for next year, is a possibility, is about $273,000. If it's you know, for, say, the, the staff that would do it for general education. Now, if we could use some of the funds recovered from last year, aka transportation, salaries, things like that, then you know, enroll it as the wisdom of the CRF had kind of stepped forward in the past. Then we could uh, you know, actually provide this program, this option for general education students, at no cost to the families that are struggling, um, and do that. You know, the blood, sweat, and tears that were suffered from last year could then be transferred to the benefit of addressing that learning loss in an ongoing fashion uh, in the summer next year. And so, because the ARPs are basically trying to help us hold down the fort now. Another, you know, another example would be the SR2s are really for um, some of the most impacted groups, which were the youngest kids. Because the kids, when they come into K, um, you know, in the lower grades, they really need those years. And if they don't get a certain amount of progress during that time, that transfers into a magnified effect over the grades as they continue up into the higher grades. So the pandemic last year, you know, remotes and all that greatly affected that population. Both preschool coming into K, they're not ready. They're not ready the way they normally would be. Um, so we have a teacher in K, and we have a teacher in two to offset some of those sizes, give them much more personalized attention um, through these next three years. Uh, and that's one of the most profound ways we can impact those groups is by giving them the most personalized attention across we can. So that's how the ARPs are kind of, kind of allocated, especially at R3 over the next couple of years, because you can use it over the next couple of years. So um, you're given that ability. So we can do what we can for all men. But um, these summer programs are impactful. And so that was the thought was that we would be and requesting, although for logistical reasons, I suppose we were unable to get together between June and September, 
And now that we are able to sit down, that there'd be some consideration potentially given to extending the CRF, um, having a conversation now so that we can offer that some provision or education. Um, if I had to include that in the budget and we had to take the impact of, say, the special ed increase, you're looking at $673,000 right out of the door. More than a percent and a half already out, already set in stone. If we were to do this general ed, and it's already a percent set pretty much in stone for special ed next year, we already have a percent of the board's budget pretty much nailed that without any other conversations. Yeah. So that just gives you an idea. And the more of these individuals that we cannot help recover from these kinds of COVID impacts, the greater number will be seeking special services, both through intervention and potentially special education. So what we don't solve, we exacerbate. Um, you know, and uh, now's the time to kind of throw everything at it that we can, because we certainly have problems with like a bit. So that's essentially what brings us to, you know, to the topic of this year. Again, we just did not have a chance for everybody to get together for the June, September period. So this is the first opportunity in the board and the council to kind of Thank you, Dr. Roy. Uh, open the floor if there's any commentary from Board of Education members that would like to add anything or for counselors to any questions for Dr. Roy or Board of Education members. Yes. Yeah. Um, so obviously, Dr. Willa, thank you for putting this together. Um, I just kind of wanted to um, reiterate the fact that this um, fund also has no risk to the town council. That if for some reason we do not need it, which I understand that there is a very good likelihood, that money will revert back to the town. So I just want to let everybody know that it's kind of like a no risk option. And <laughs> if, if you all do in fact approve it. Um, and also that um, I know Dr. Willis got, you know, the associate educators and the extended school year, the dollar amounts here, but this is also something that will go through the finance and facilities um, committee, as well as then the entire board of that just to kind of go through and make sure that it's everything that we had talked about that falls under the COVID relief fund. And um, I recognize that you know, we don't exactly know what next summer is going to look like. So it might, you know, it might evolve differently, maybe better, maybe not, who knows. By the time we would actually be submitting the um, dollar amounts um, to the fund. So I just kind of wanted to say that to all of you that there will be you know, lots of kind of looking at this along the way for the next six to eight, nine months, whatever it ends up being. Um, but um, um, again, that's, that's pretty much all I had in addition to uh, this one pager. Thank you, Dr. Willett, for the one pager <laughs> that, um, that was presented here tonight. But if anybody has any questions, we can certainly answer. Are there any questions? And again, for counselors that are remote, you want to raise your hand with the raise hand function. Otherwise, I'll take questions from the council in person. Seeing none. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I kind of knew you, you were writing quite well, so. <laughs> no, <laughs> of course. Um, okay, so I have a question in regards to um, you had mentioned like there, it's a no risk thing, right? So I guess my question back is last year there was about 250 ish thousand ish left. Um, that was put into the COVID fund. Yep. But you guys used the COVID fund instead of paying for it out of the eight hundred thousand dollars that was left in the budget. So, if that's the case going forward, can we say if there are dollars left at the end of next year, you're going to use it, use those dollars before going to the fund? Because then we just keep perpetuating the. If you had taken the two hundred fifty thousand out of your eight hundred thousand, we'd be looking at. You know, $550,000 left instead of $800,000. Yeah, but the 250 is for sure. going back to current year. But that is the current year salary. So we really. Oh, no, no. What are you talking about? The 250000 $280,000. Yeah, what yeah. it was for last year's COVID fund. Right. So that uh, $80,000, you had $800,000 left at the end of the year. 
you could have paid for that 280,000 out of the 800,000 um, rather than using the COVID fund and then have another 800,000 left. It, it would have. I think at the time, and Dr. Lee, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think we knew we were going to have $800,000 left over. So, yes, we did run, I have the list here, we did run basically that 283 through the COVID fund. I don't think we anticipated having that much left over at the end, but that's a fair point, you know, and I think, um, I don't think the same thing would happen this year, and the board would probably stand on that. I think we fill just about every teacher position. We're not expecting any. Um, let's hope as long as the schools don't, don't shut down, we should be using our buses right. normally. As long as the only problem. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, nothing's, I guess, ever total. Um, you know, the, the thing about it is that at the end of the day, it all goes to the town. So utilize or not, if there's an end of your balance, ultimately it rolls to the town. And CRF will not be, you know, uh, they, understandably it will not be available in perpetuity. And I think that the, the idea was, you know, ultimately, we had a lot of weird challenges last year. Nobody was buying food, you know, like, and so we, as you know, cookies, we, we make a lot of money on it. So the, the point is that regardless, you know, there were things that we had to fill holes with and, and to Ms. Griffin's point, you really just don't know until you get to the end. And ultimately the concept was as long as the coronavirus is with us, it constantly flexes and flows and changes. We don't know what we're going to do exactly when. And so that was the genius behind the design the council had was that this is here. It rolls into this, and at the end of the day, if it's not needed, it could roll the ERF, and the ERF has already gotten its percent. It rolls to the town. So the general fund doesn't risk anything here, really. It just, you know, if it's needed and ultimately can be used for the offsets of things that were impacted by the virus, then it's available for that purpose. And that's what we would be looking for next year. The thing, the difference between last year and this year is we have a much more specific idea as to what we would need and we have it much, much earlier. So this now, this proposal would be to use it for the summer. And that's a very specific utilization of, of the coronavirus um, money. That money that we didn't use from all the suffering of last year, you know, there were chunks of that, that in this case, this particular piece could do great good for these children in the summer of 2022. Um, and so, and at the end of the day, again, if not all of it is utilized for that purpose, it rolls back to the town. So, you know, there's some really great opportunity to do you know, wonderful, you know, good for these kids um, by doing the, the summer program. And that's the proposal here, is have those funds go directly and specifically to that um, and help with the, you know, the quarantine issues that we're having. Um, and then at the end, when you get to June to, to September, if, uh, if that's fulfilled its purpose and then hopefully, you see, you know, coronavirus is heading in a different direction away from humanity, then we really would not need to have any further extension of that. But that was but that was the design. Uh, plus, I don't know if who's hanging these things in here, but they look a lot like <laughs> those books. I'm thinking like the, the, the trees from uh -oh. from uh, from Doctor Seuss. <laughs> I'm looking at the Laura. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Horton here's a who. I'm all I see on. right now are Horton here's a who. I thought of that when we first sat down. I was like, oh, that's so Horton. <laughs> Um, okay, so I guess I, I have one little question for my own my own edification then, Dr. Holden. If we were 270, almost $271,000 under in, in sped spend last year, and you're saying it's going to go up 400000 is it 400000 from actuals or 400000 from budget? Because you're talking about a $671,000 swing. Yeah, from last well, year right now it's based on the, every time we do it, we base it on you know, what we can see from the programs in place now that are going to be needed. Um, but the problem that we have at the moment is that probably more than ever before, uh, the kids that are in need um, 
you know, these programmatic requirements, these are things that have been exacerbated by the pandemic. So we, we might have made a projection before, but we're, we're actually seeing a lot more, I don't want to use the word like a lot more required of the school system with respect to the needs of the children because the pandemic is excessive. And so that was the meeting we had today. It was just looking at it and going, you know, these, these numbers have names associated with them. There are people that are connected to the numbers we're talking about for next year, and not just say projections about what might kind of be the case. This is the programs that that they you know, need at the moment. So I guess that's my my question overall. Then, right? is this sped as in outplacement or sped as an intervention in the yeah, program yeah. and everything else? Yeah, okay, so that is probably you know, I would say that to some extent outplacements are also, a, but it's uh, it's everything. There's not one. Whether you look at any of the categories that um, the pandemic has affected, uh, psychologists need people to cover the bases. Uh, speech and language pathologists we needed people and need people cover the bases and there just aren't enough people to do it. And the services that are needed are much more than what we were you know, previously needed to provide. So across all categories, the vulnerable uh, uh, in every situation when you have a challenge to, uh, I think, our culture, you know, to people, the people that are vulnerable in one way or another feel that more profoundly. And then they need assistance and they need to be uh, those issues, those challenges need to be addressed. And that's what's happening right now. <clears throat> Whether you're talking about general education population students or students um, that are students of special education, those needs have been magnified and are you know, clearly in front of us. We don't have one of the biggest challenges, for instance, transportation. There's no way we'll have, and we're not going to be in the shutdown for transportation. Um, salaries, you know, we're, we're, we're needing to add, we don't have that option of not having the assistant principal and, um, you know, or not having uh, the you know, athletic director. We have to have both of those positions. Not only that, we have to pay a lot of these people uh, additional um, funds to do certain things that, um, you know, that need to be covered that we would not normally have needed. Everything this year is extended um, what individuals can do to make it work because uh, you know the, uh, the needs now of these kids they they're they're just so profound and they, they suffered through a long span of time where they just weren't getting everything that they could have gotten. So um, you know we won't get those kinds of things happening this year, whether it's transportation. We're going to get nailed with the tuitions, whereas there was a lull. Now there'll be a spike. Um, you know, the salaries are not going to see that kind of thing. Not at the end of this year, um, and so then residually, some of those other items won't either. Cleaning, I'm not sure where. I don't think we're going to end horribly in cleaning, but I don't think that we're, that's going to save the day with respect to balances either. So, you know, I think at the end of this year, we have a, a more so than in many other years in the past more of a risk of running right on a red line and that, that those funds would be very helpful in helping provide say the silver lining for the kids who had to suffer so my last question then is um the the er the the, the crf and the ESSER funds those are not in the regular budget correct they're being handled out directly through the funding so it's not part of NDR. Um, I don't think they are part of the NDR, but I would have to check. Okay. ESSER, I would have to check. Yeah, I think ESSER should be kind of the off budget. Yeah, I would think it is. But... Okay. Are there any other questions from council members or comments, concerns, questions from board members? Otherwise, it's just a general discussion or a kind of general consensus to continue the fund and then meet back again between June and September of 2022 to reassess the feasibility. Yeah, you, there was a request at the end to transfer a certain amount into that fund and that would be then either fulfilled by the council as an extension of that fund or not. That is in your totally in the council's purview. Okay. 
Well, to be technically, if we hadn't uh, been going through a place in this, we were, you know, everybody was going through, right. that this, these two bodies would have sat down between June and September to talk about that. Understandably, there was a lot of things so that there was not an opportunity and that this is the first chance we have to do. But, you know, the very solid ask for what we would be using. So that's, um, that would be the request that this then get continued. Mm -hmm. With the language, you know, um, with the understanding that in this case we really are using it not for materials so much, but for people, because it's the people we need the most. It's the staff for the summer school. It's the you know, so the educators that we otherwise may not have out for that thing. Go ahead, and then uh, Christina. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, so was there? Like, do you need to know? I'm sorry if I missed it. Do you need to know soon, or does the board of ed need to know soon if we're gonna? Well, we're we're forming the budget that? now. Um, What's that? We're, we're forming the budget now. Okay, right. The superintendent's proposed budget is typically the second week, roughly, right. um, in January. And I'm going to speak to Ms. Griffin after the meeting tonight about a few things. Yeah. But um, <laughs> these, these all relate generally to budget. And so, um, you know, what I would be recommending to the board will, will change based on what happens to CRF. Um, we do have, you know, as I'm going through everything, we have three big hurdles. One is there were investments, and investments help in the year that is right next to the year that you make them, but they often lower the budget for the subsequent year. And so that was an, an evil that we knew was going to be a part of the picture. So fiscal year 23 has climbing back out of some of the things that we had invested. <laughs> um, the second is, you know, obviously that uh, we have some, some impacts from COVID that we have to address. Special ed is one, and this would be another. So um, we will be climbing a bit out of that investment situation, and we'll also need to address special ed needs, and we'll need to address learning loss. And if we put all those together, that's almost a percent and a half to 2% before we talk about it. And typically, the town generally likes about a 2.5 or roughly. That's generally the thematic kind of thing in there is what you know, can be supported as a 1.8 to a 2 something and so on. The board's request would be two almost without talking about anything other than special ed. Um, you know, summers would perhaps if we included that in the kind of <coughs> to investment situation. And that's a tough place to start. So see you around the break. Christian? I was going to say, I think basically what we need from you guys is this purpose of agreement. On the last page, yeah. just revise. So I don't know if you guys want to put it on our council agenda. Um, yeah. It's going to be one page or two pages. After reconciliation, it's just like the ERF fund, it has to go all the way through reconciliation. Um, like after the end of the year closing, it's just the same sort of thing as the ERF. ERF, right, Lisa? The, That's usually in December or January. The ERF is usually, um, it has to be in the third, the, end of the, the, the third quarter of the year for the, for the education reserve fund. The COVID fund we funded earlier uh, in the previous year, and certainly the audit is almost complete. And I, from my understanding, I don't think there's been any changes yet to the surplus that I'm aware of. Um, so if the town council is so desired to want to put um, this on their next agenda or whichever agenda you want it on, um, I don't think there would be any issue in, um, if you decide to allocate those funds, I don't think there would be any issue with allowing that to happen if, if you chose to do so. Um, I, just the CRF fund, uh, excuse me, the education reserve fund would have to wait until the third quarter and we could put it in the tickler file to for allocation at that point if for your consideration. So if you give me direction that you want it on the next agenda, agenda for consideration, I can 
Are there any councilors that would be opposed to having it on the next agenda for consideration? If one of those carry out, then it ties to the audit. Councilor Lucy, Councilor Lou, do you have any objection for it being on the next regular meeting agenda? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's Lulu, but no, no, uh, no objection. Thank you. This, this is Brenda Felucci. I find no objection. I'm very agreeable to what I've seen in this packet and what I've heard. Um, and I'd like to take this opportunity to um, express to Dr. Willett and his entire staff um, to thank you for taking care of our kids, keeping them safe, educated, and healthy during this pandemic and continuing to do so. Like you said, this was a very heavy lift. Um, and I just don't have the words to express how thankful I am that um, with for all the work that you've done. Lucy, so I think there is general consensus, at least that we can have that on the next agenda. So Dr. Will, if you're able to attend, write any additional information or Christine or any board members that would like to attend. If there's additional questions needed, we can also transmit them electronically and that added to the packet. Yeah, electronically, I think it's December 14th. Okay. No worries. All right. Well, then, if there's no other discussion, I would entertain a motion to adjourn at 9 45 p.m. Second. 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 Second.